So it's good that we have two different systems to make me more uh, hearable. <laughs> so we shall start this morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you again here. And uh, my special hello, my special greetings to the uh, also to the virtual audience. And uh, I see Laura, who is uh, many, many hours behind our uh, time. So it's uh, I think it's late night in Argentina. And uh, so Laura, hello to you. And hello to everybody who joins us also in the virtual mode. Uh, today we are starting our day by uh, my presentation on the, um, well, it will focus on our solutions for characterization and sorting, but uh, also I will briefly uh, touch upon uh, other techniques, um, other available solutions for this area for site remediation, especially for treatment of bulk materials such as soil in the end of the decommissioning projects. Oh wherever, whenever it's needed for the purposes of the operator and utility. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a uh, brief um, introduction, um, why do we have to measure? Yeah, Why do we have to uh, do something to the soil? Uh, to bulk materials, uh, we have to in the in the uh, later or in the latest uh, stage of decommissioning, we come uh, to the um, moment when we have to check that uh, the site is uh, site can be cleared, and for this uh, matter, we have to check whether um, it's not contaminated. And uh, as we discussed be discussed before in the previous days, no, 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 bef before them, uh, this one. Uh -huh. uh, so. Uh, in the period of operation of the nuclear facility, there can be a situation that uh, uh, there were some cases of spills of uh, some release of uh, radioactive materials also to the soil. Of course, that's uh, minor uh, cases not normally, yes, but uh, anyway, before clearance of the and the free release uh, of the um, material in the site of all material, we have to check that uh, it's below the limits that are set by the regulator. And um, uh, here in the left side, you can see um, just uh, kind of a, a brief view how it's uh, treated by IEA. Uh, so I uh, put some um, uh, thresholds for different um, um, ways to treat that. So for example, for free release, uh, we can use uh, this area in the middle. Uh, so it's uh, if it's below, um, uh, then we can consider that region for optimization of release of, uh, in case of um, there are certain restrictions. And if uh, there are no restrictions, then it's you can see it on the right side. Um, we can uh, have it a little bit higher. So uh, the um, um, levels below 10 uh, microzeverts per, uh, year is something that we can neg um, neglect, so we cannot consider. But uh, from there, up to 300 uh, microzeros per year, that's the reason, uh, region where we can consider that uh, the land can be uh, free released, yeah, but uh, with some considerations. And uh, above that, in the upper side, upper parts, you can see the area uh, with those limits up to one uh, uh, millisievert. Uh, per year, and that's uh, the region uh, for restricted use. And uh, in some practices, national practices in some countries, it's possible, for example, to uh, either to have it as brownfield, so to use it for our industrial uses, or for example, the um, uh, soil that uh, is considered within these limits from 300 microzevert to one millisievert. Uh, uh, it can be um, uh, used for other purposes, uh, uh, well, not exactly uh, free released, but it can be used uh, for industrial uses, like under some um, roads or some to put it uh, in the under structures of the industrial buildings, etc. In some special facilities, for example. And um, also here on the right side, you can see the uh, references, uh, how the limits are treated for several important radio lights in uh, IE. So that's uh, the upper figures, like uh, you can see actually that it's similar here in both cases and in Russia in our uh, legislation. So in case of uh, IE, uh, here we refer to GSR part three. Uh, there is a table one, 
1.1 uh, that uh, sets the limits for each radiant light uh, for the limits uh, for free release. And um, in Russian case, we have uh, what is called ASPORP 99, that is a major sanitary uh, regulation for radiation safety. And uh, it has several appendices, uh, several uh, tables in the end where you can refer to different types of materials, including bulk material in this case, um, uh, setting the limits for free release or conditional release. We can go ahead. Well, now about solutions available in the market for this uh, matter for treating of bulk materials. So actually we can uh, talk not about uh, not only about soil, but we can talk about uh, any bulk material like um, other types uh, crushed uh, um, construction materials or something else. So um, for example, if you have it in uh, some kind of containers, uh, you can see the solutions in the uh, three rows from second through fourth, yeah, where you can take your container, uh, no, no, before, before, <laughs> of different types, like um, it can be B25, it can be um, barrels or drums of 200 liters, 160 uh, liters and uh, some others any types, uh, whatever you have. And uh, by putting it on the special tray, uh, by adjusting the, the height, you can uh, scan it for, uh, check it for uh, contamination for activity. And um, uh, basically, uh, what is the difference between uh, this three uh, and the first one, Fremes, which is our solution, is that uh, in uh, our case, you can use just any kind of uh, um, loading device uh, like a truck, for example, that uh, you don't have to put it first in some container into big bags or drums or whatever. So you can directly put it on the uh, conveyor belt and uh, then flow uh, as a flow, it goes through the uh, system of um, uh, Germanian detectors and uh, uh, first measures. Um, the activities and then it uh, goes for sorting and the rest of the um, uh, solutions that well are quite famous in the market normally what they uh, what uh, they propose is that uh, we use a containerized waste we measure it and then you can um, either decide whether it's uh, below the limits and it can be set for free release or uh, conditional release or uh, contaminated for further storage and disposal uh, as a, let's say, a final waste after the project. Uh, here in these cases, um, I will talk more uh, in the rest of the presentation about uh, our solution about uh, Fremis. Uh, and here just uh, to mention some characteristics, some features of uh, other solutions in the market. So um, you can see uh, the one by Canberra. Canberra is a part of Mirion, so that's quite uh, famous. I have seen that in use. Uh, like uh, we uh, WM2500 uh, or they have other solutions like uh, Isaacs, for example, that's quite used and can be used for different uh, uh, sizes, different uh, geometry and uh, different uh, types of containers with the waste. Uh, well, uh, it's let's say quite efficient in speed but that also depends how much of the bulk material you have to treat uh canberra's solution contains um, uh, high purity germanium detectors in this case it's uh, four detectors inside so um it takes um, something like it's indicated like 30 minutes for uh b25 container to check or uh, you can even measure ISOL container uh, during two or three hours, uh, you will have the measurements. So um, next one uh, you can see by Nuvia, it's also, it also uses uh, high purity germanium detectors. It has two detectors and um, uh, its throughput is around uh, three tons per hour. Uh, in case of, uh, you can uh, compare to other uh, systems. So, well, it's, uh, it's quite efficient also. Uh, it can go in batches, also in a containerized uh, manner. Another one also that I featured here is one with a uh, natri um, natri uh, sodium, sodium iodine um, scintillators. Uh, it has, uh, here in this uh, composition, it has uh, two rows of uh, uh, sets of these uh, scintillators. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, 
kind of divides in sections uh, the um, uh, container that you put on this uh, special platform and uh, also it uh, measures um, and gives uh, well quite quite good results but uh, what's the difference between all of these let's say uh, the um, uh, first one uh, that I will be talking about later it also has uh, uh, first it's very precise and second it's easy to load there you don't have to uh, use the uh, uh, first containerization and uh, third very important uh, thing is that it also allows you to sort the waste let's go ahead so here uh, I will talk more in uh, detail about uh, this solution that was in the first column. That's uh, uh, Fremis solution. Uh, it stands for free release measurement system. And um, uh, basically it can be used for different types of uh, bulk materials such as soil. Uh, primarily what is um, uh, what may be of interest, but also um, it was extended and it's used and uh, proved to be efficient for building materials, construction materials such as crushed concrete uh, left uh, left uh, over uh, after um, uh, demolishing all the buildings, for example, all the buildings and structures in the nuclear site. And it can be also used for other loose materials, but so that's a matter of um, methodology and uh, uh, adjustment. So uh, in the um, um, uh, later on, I will show how it works in, in more detail. Here just uh, briefly is that first it characterizes the material uh, according to the uh, contamination and then it sorts into the you can see here in the picture so it starts there on the left side uh, goes through a conveyor line and then uh, the system uh, by uh, checking the uh, activity of the uh, bulk material on this uh, conveyor belt uh, that is set with a certain maximum uh, thickness of the layer broadness of the layer so it uses uh, complicated algorithm to um, pass through germanium detectors, check uh, activity, and then sort it into uh, different batches. So it can be uh, like here, for example, this is the largest pile that goes for free release materials. So for example, when one is um, full, then uh, this uh, device can be just moved to the next one, to the next one. And then a special truck just takes away the free release material. Uh, depending uh, on the um, uh, specifics or on the um, regulation in the country, uh, this material can be further uh, used freely in, in uh, any kind of um, um, uh, applications. Or uh, in some countries, it's um, uh, still there are some limits for further use, it, even if you know that uh, it's uh, actually below the limits set for free release. So uh, other batches, uh, other flows of waste, it's a uh, conditional uh, waste and uh, contaminated uh, that uh, you can see, for example, uh, according to the limits of a regulator here, we indicate that clean is below one becquerel per gram, uh, slightly contaminated or some kind of conditional waste is uh, uh, between one and 10 becquerel per gram and uh, red waste is above uh, 10 per, per gram. But the system, uh, the system is uh, normally even more conservative. So it sets for uh, release um, um, kind of 10% maximum, 10% of the limit. So it still has the margin for any kind of, um, uh, let's say situation when uh, there might be some uh, discrepancy from the uh, results, even if it's uh, very precise. So it's very conservative and definitely that goes for the, uh, for the um, free release option. We can go ahead. So here you can uh, see some uh, major features and uh, advantages of the system. So uh, where is it useful? It's useful for the um, characterization and sorting of uh, large uh, sites, uh, potentially contaminated sites. For example, uh, definitely we have to know what was there. Uh, for example, if it was a nuclear facility that uh, was, um, let's say, uh, in the nuclear fuel cycle and uh, it was... Um, some fabrication facility, you know the operation history, operation track records of the facility, and uh, you know what to no, no, what to expect there. Uh, what kind of uh, um, range of radionuclides uh, can be there? What's nuclide vector, etc. So uh, you can expect how to set the um, detection 
um, in the system and uh, how to uh, characterize it correctly. Uh, definitely first, um, um, if, if you are not sure, yes, uh, definitely we can use first some uh, lab uh, tests. So take some samples of the lens and uh, see what's inside if we are not sure. And then uh, we set the uh, characteristics of the system so that it would be especially uh, looking for these uh, nuclides. Uh, what does it offer? It offers um, very good uh, efficiency in case of uh, this large volumes of uh, bulk materials because as for our track records, for our experience, uh, the free release can be up to or even more than 90% of the material, uh, which means that um, if normally we would use characterization to just to uh, then package, passportize, uh, so get the certificate for the batch of uh, waste, then we send it uh, for uh, the storage. In this case, we can separate the uh, clean from um, unclean, from contaminated, and uh, this uh, definitely raises efficiency of, of uh, costs of uh, the storage, and um, uh, this brings a substantial advantage for the operator. Also, the system is um, uh, working in automated way, so um, it's minimal involvement of personnel needed. And um, you can also um, include several other options uh, to, uh, to, uh, to treat some specific uh, characteristics uh, of, the, uh, of this bulk material. So for example, if it's expected that uh, there would be some larger fractions like stones, uh, some of us have seen how it works, yeah, so um, in Angars, for example, where we have uh, this facility set in Russia, uh, so it, um, uh, the system can be uh, ex extended with a special module to pre-treat the waste, uh, to pre-get um, preliminary um, sieving, uh, to get it to the right structure, to, to write, um, let's say, uh, grain size and this um, uh, uh, piece of size to, to get it um, into the um, conveyor uh, further step of uh, characterization and sorting. System is mobile, so it can be brought from um, uh, one place to another in um, uh, containers. It um, has uh, normally two 40 feet containers and one 20 feet containers. Uh, container and um, what else? It uh, uses high purity germanium detectors. It uh, registers uh, gamma emitters from 50 kF to 1.5 uh, uh, mF and um, uh, can be adjusted to the requirements of the facility. Uh, so, uh, in the end, uh, it also gives report. You can see the report here in this part. So, uh, this report can be Again, the, uh, its template can be adjusted to the parameters that are needed, so it will show the, um, all the characteristics that are needed for the regulator to uh, make the decision that, for example, this batch can be released from uh, regulator's control. Let's go ahead. So here's uh, schematically how it works. Uh, the view from the top and uh, the view from the side. Uh, so first you have uh, some kind of uh, track or some, some uh, device that uh, brings the, um, uh, some container with waste, uh, unloads that onto the uh, vertically sloped um, um, side of the part of the conveyor belt. And then it's brought, definitely uh, the angle <laughs> is not so steep, so it's more, more flat. Yeah, and uh, then it goes to the uh, conveyor belt where uh, the red, uh, this red uh, thing, small thing, is a limiter of the height of the layer. So um, it sets this um, um, needed thickness of the layer uh, that will prove that uh, the efficiency of the measurements will be uh, correct, and also the um, uh, batches uh, uh, volumes will be um, calculated correctly. Then you, we have a set of uh, high purity germanium detectors. Uh, so the um, yeah, uh, the speed is uh, adjusted to uh, let's say needed throughput. So uh, we have tested it uh, up to ten tons per hour, but it can vary. So uh, vary. So we can set it for uh, smaller, or actually, it also uh, it's also possible to use it uh, at a higher speed. Um, but um, uh, this should be first tested. 
Uh, then uh, after um, uh, this uh, operation of uh, characterization, the uh, waste is uh, put onto this segregator. And uh, as you have seen, you can see it here on the top uh, picture. Uh, automatically, it uh, brings, if it's um, above the limit set uh, for uh, contaminated waste, it goes into the small container. If it's, uh, uh, it's a big bag, you can see it in the blue parts in this uh, vertical um, small module of um, uh, container. Uh, if it's um, uh, conditionally contaminated, that goes into another batch. And uh, if it's a uh, free release material, uh, it also uh, sees the uh, some adjacent uh, areas, whether it's also not contaminated, then it's uh, it can go for free release for one of these um, batches. Let's go ahead. Thank you. So uh, here is some brief uh, information about uh, the experience of testing the system, so uh, approbation or references in Europe. Uh, so this uh, system was uh, used in the South Belgium for the nuclear fuel cycle facility, and um, uh, it was it came through uh, some stage of. Uh, uh, first uh, tests of whether it's uh, precise. Uh, the um, uh, regulator was uh, um, looking into the and comparing the measurements uh, by um, comparing to Isaacs, by the way, which I sh uh, have shown, I was uh, talk uh, talking about in the second slide. And um, uh, they made sure that uh, the measurements are very precise. So uh, they decided and they um, uh, made this provision that uh, uh, the company, the uh, utility can use uh, the system for free release. So it could, could be used for as a kind of a measurement um, uh, device. Uh, that was uh, certified, kind of certified, approved, approved by the regulator for setting the material free release. And in total, in the period um, of around uh, two years, um, about 45 tons of uh, bulk materials uh, uh, material was treated. It's, uh, it uh, contains uh, around 30 tons of, uh, uh, sorry, 1,000 tons of um, uh, the uh, potentially contaminated soil. And um, uh, later on, they extended the project to also to um, to make the characterization of um, uh, crushed concrete. And uh, around 15 uh, more thousand tons of uh, crushed concrete were also uh, treated uh, with this system. And um, uh, in this way, the um, operational characteristics were com com confirmed uh, and the system uh, got the references. Uh, quite uh, successfully. Another case where um, the system was used uh, in uh, Europe, it's uh, Hanau in Germany, and uh, um, there uh, this um, uh, the facility was uh, uh, used for uh, characterization and sorting of the bulk material at uh, the former fuel production plants that also included uh, MOX fuel. Uh, so that uh, gives a special let's say, uh, um, level of complexity to the project and additional references also with those uh, plutonium materials and so uh, that group. So uh, after the project in Dessel and in Hanau, some, uh, well, definitely uh, as it was like first uh, large scale use of the system, uh, some um, uh, minor issues were discovered and uh, uh, improved so that uh, the system would be more adjusted uh, to the uh, operational phase. Let's see the next slide. Here you can see uh, the project, a, a, little, a little bit of information about the project that was realized uh, in Russia, in our um, Angarsk uh, site. It's um, Angarsky uh, electro electrolysis uh, plant uh, in the region close to Irkutsk. Um, uh, very beautiful uh, place. Uh, and it has an extensive um, uh, track records in the nuclear industry. It's uh, the uh, one of the major plants um, of Rosatom for enrichment of uranium. And um, uh, no, 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 before, so it, it has um, um, several uh, workshops, very large workshops for um, uh, gas diffusion um, and sublimate production. Uh, and uh, some of these workshops were decommissioned, so there is a site that uh, needed <clears throat> treatment, 
needed to be checked whether the uh, land, uh, whether the soil is uh, not contaminated and whether it uh, uh, needs any kind of uh, segregation to make it uh, uh, clear. So uh, this, this site was used as uh, the approbation site for Russian for Russia for this uh, facility and uh, it was expected that uh, there could be something around uh, 100,000 of cubic meters of potentially contaminated soils. And um, uh, moreover, uh, the um, expectations were also that we could also treat uh, the crushed concrete from the construction materials also with this facility, also to um, make um, relevant operations to decrease the volumes of the waste, secondary waste. Uh, here we, by the way, there is a small mistake here, but I just draw your attention that uh, it's a uh, nucleate vector is uh, up to uh, 1.5 uh, mega electron volt uh, from 50 kF to 1.5 mev. I will um, check and uh, um, correct this. Uh, the model that we used is it's called BM10, uh, so 10 stands for uh, 10. Uh, tons per hour, and um, uh, last year uh, the um, uh, this um, uh, approbation um, project was uh, carried out in the several months, uh, and it finished in September two thousand twenty-two. Uh, so uh, the um, um, the site um, by some samples was uh, pre-checked, and um, after the um, uh, carrying out this uh, uh, project on uh, approbation, uh, it was proved to be efficiently, well, let's say, cleaned. Yeah, uh, efficiently checked for for the uh, and sorted for the matter of um, contaminated soil. Uh, so, um, what can we mention here? Let's. Uh, I think let's go ahead for the next slide. Yeah. Here you can see in the pictures uh, the facility itself, and uh, one of our experts from Newcom that is uh, that what was was participating in uh, um, putting uh, commissioning the uh, facility and uh, checking its. Uh, uh, characteristics in the operation. Uh, it's a little bit complicated <laughs> scheme in the left part, sorry. Um, but uh, basically what was added here, as far as uh, I was mentioning that uh, in some areas, in some facilities, um, the uh, soil can be not very um, homogeneous, not very uh, even in the size of the, in its structure. So we have added a special preliminary treatment of uh, uh, the um, uh, batches of material incoming on the conveyor. So it was additionally added uh, the uh, sieving, uh, crushing module. So uh, after that, um, um, this material could go into the conveyor for the characterization and sorting as was uh, uh, intended. And uh, the results of the test is that uh, during uh, the period from June through September of 2002, um, to 2022, more than 50 tons of um, the um, uh, uh, soil were processed, and um, out of it, uh, around 18 tons were put for free release, and um, uh, the rest was uh, set according to the levels of uh, um, um, uh, detection and uh, limits for cont contamination, uh, set into different batches, different batches. <clears throat> Also, some upgrades and modifications were done to the system, such as uh, it was um, retrofitted with additional measuring models and um, uh, integrated with ultrasonic technologies and uh, measurements of uh, results were harmonized with uh, uh, other types of uh, spectrometric equipment. Uh, so, yes, I think it's more or less... Uh, Coming to the end of my presentation, uh, just to mention that now the facility is uh, already um, came to the stage of um, um, industrial use. It's also intended to be used for um, this um, testing of uh, characterization of uh, crushed concrete materials. Uh, so um, 
well, more or less, I think it's all, it's um, uh, proved to be efficient for the metrics that we have. Again, uh, we are talking about large volumes of uh, soil, large volumes of materials. So definitely when uh, we're talking about some small uh, batches, um, uh, some other systems can be um, uh, more competitive, but uh, uh, in our cases, when we are talking about uh, the end of remediation projects, end of the uh, uh, decommissioning projects, uh, sometimes it uh, helps to have the economy of many millions of uh, dollars or euro uh, when we talk about uh, the um, uh, how soon can we release uh, the uh, withdraw the license on decommissioning and uh, uh, set the um, uh, site um, uh, cleared and um, uh, um, co consider it uh, released from the um, um, regulator's control. So here it's helpful a lot. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, I think, let's see, I think it's all uh, for my presentation. And thank you very much for your attention. Any questions, suggestions <laughs> to me or my colleagues? Thank you. Also here, by the way, we have this QR code where you can see the video um, on this uh, facility. Any questions? Yes, please. Thank you for a nice uh, presentation. I just uh, want to learn that um, you are sorting the soil and uh, there are low, medium or high activi activity. Uh, is it uh, used or is it, um, for example, uh, sometimes we need some CRM cert certified refer Sometimes we need uh, certified reference materials. In the past, IAA has some uh, soil, um, maybe also Professor Basim knows and use uh, for uh, radioactivity measurement, you need some uh, certified reference materials. Are these soil, uh, this soil also can be sorted and uh, can be sold commercially to the universities, enterprises, who, uh, and they are very useful for calibration of the detector. Uh, for now on, uh, I think uh, from Chernobyl, uh, they sent, uh, they sell uh, um, teas, uh, produced teas at, at the time of after a Chernobyl accident, tea, tea, uh, just, uh, uh, just uh, dry leaves of tea, contaminated tea, contaminated tea, yeah, uh, they decrease a little bit uh, activity of tea, they mix with, uh, they blend it. And they sell the university and all over the world and all these. We buy it and as a reference material, we put on our detector and we calibrate our system. It is known activity and yeah, it is used deliberately and they make money. Uh, you you pay hundreds of euros for half a kilo or hundreds of grams, something like that. And also the soil will be very useful if they mix and yeah, yeah, by the way, if they blend it, yeah, it can be very useful. Just, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's really interesting uh, thing that you mentioned. Uh, just um, uh, to uh, answer to your first, um, let's say, uh, um, noticing about uh, the batches, I, I wanted to say that it's not just uh, sorting into low, medium, and uh, let's say higher contaminated yeah the most important is that uh, it's uh, sorts into free release which is uh, actually below the limits yeah for free release and for other can be set according to regulators requirements so the most important is that uh, if regulation allows then a uh, huge amount of this material can be released for any kind of use so definitely uh, normally a storage is not cheap yeah for uh, for the waste uh, for the right waste so um, in many countries also there is a situation that the licensed storages get to the uh, limits of uh, what they can uh, take for, for storage yeah so um, uh, this can be really crucial to have a possibility for large sites to uh, sort it and uh, to avoid this necessity of bringing the waste uh, unsorted to some uh, maybe slightly less contamination but uh, for the storage and uh, just as a reference I can say about um, some um, cases and discussions that we had in Europe for example that uh, uh, at uh, one of the NPP sites um, 
potentially what they expected and what they wanted to check is around 15 to 20,000 tons of land of all this soil. So if you calculate, if we, if you use, for example, uh, this uh, uh, the um, drums of uh, 200 liters, or you use uh, Isaacs with uh, larger batches, but still it's uh, like, I don't know, cubic meters, yeah? Uh, so uh, here we can talk about significant, uh, sig significantly higher efficiency and possibility for a uh, uh, utility not to pay those extra millions for extra years of being under regulation. Plus, it's a matter of safety, definitely. So to have it clean of in the more nearest uh, prospect and also maybe to have uh, other plans for this site. Yeah, so it just gives you flexibility. But about the teas, definitely, and about the soils, it's a, it's a good idea. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Yulia, thank you for a very nice presentation. We just wanted to clarify um, whether this uh, cleared soil with uh, activity of uh, lower than one picarel per gram, which is subject to free release. Uh, it is um, a free release or exemption. What uh, did you do? It's very important uh, to uh, get to the point uh, where it's not yet done, uh, that uh, the um, uh, waste acceptance criteria, that uh, free release criteria is set by the regulators. So that's uh, the work for each state where it's not uh, yet available. So these figures are more or less like an, an example. So it can be uh, here you have to work with the uh, documentation, with the um, uh, legislation that is uh, set in the country. In our example, I, I mentioned uh, uh, um, these uh, figures that are equal to uh, those of IEA, uh, so it can be free released. As well as, for example, for the metals, yes, uh, when we treat uh, contaminated uh, some some yes parts of equipment, equipment it can be um, uh, decontaminated and then it can be. Um, sold by the utility to any kind of use uh, for the industry. <clears throat> That's a matter. I think I need to uh, ch to check with the, our local project managers in Russia. Yeah, but um, can I have your question? I, I know that uh, there is a uh, quite tricky part about this. Uh, um, let's say. Uh, small regions of uh, contamination. But um, let's turn to this question later. I think with the Gleb Barashov, we can discuss it all together. Yeah, so uh, if we are not running out of time, I think it's uh, more or less exactly according to our schedule. Yeah, so thanks, thanks so much. <laughs> not now. Okay, uh, one more extra idea, uh, because uh, I'm leading a project, uh, radio tracer, uh, which are used uh, for characterization of the beach sand, uh, some um, either uh, erosion or uh, accretion. Sometimes we use radio tracers, and this low contaminated or ferial release uh, soil also can be put some uh, place uh, Think that there is, uh, you think that there is, there are some erosion, and you can uh, easily uh, track this uh, soil because they are uh, different from the original one, and they they carry some uh, specific radionuclides and easy to to be used as radio tracer as well. Yeah, that's. It. Yeah, please. Thank you, Yulia. So, Natalia. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
Oh, hello, everyone. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. I got it. Okay. Mm. Hello, I want uh, to present you uh, the uh, talk about environmental monitoring and uh, the modern level of environmental monitoring. Uh, what we have now, and uh, maybe we will focus on some um, questions that are um, not answered today, but uh, has very uh, important uh, role. Uh, everybody knows that intensive development of nuclear technology of both military and civil purpose in 20th century resulted in release of radiant lights to the environment. Of course, nu nuclear facilities, nuclear power plants, and others currently and main existing and potential sources of man-made radionuclides in the environment. Uh, <clears throat> here you can see a comparison uh, of amount of radionuclides released in the environment from various sources. Uh, <clears throat> The main sources of man-made radionuclides released in the environment include uh, previous nuclear test explosions in the atmosphere and activities of uh, radiochemical plants for spent nuclear fuel. For example, plant Mayak and facility in Hanford. Uh, the ordinary monitoring system includes uh, different um, samplings, and here you can see the simple scheme of uh, radiation monitoring and that involves the measurements of radiation dose or radiation light contamination uh, for reasons related to the assessment of control of exposure to radiation or radioactive substances. Uh, a system of integrated dynamic uh, surveillance, including long-term continuous monitoring of radiation kinetic situation parameters and radiation doses of the population living in the areas of radiation hazardous facilities. <clears throat> monitoring program usually includes uh, routine monitoring, emergency uh, preparedness and uh, emergency monitoring. Uh, <clears throat> Here you, you can see the typical required uh, lower limits of detection of GAVA em emitted radionuclides under conditions of normal operation and emergency situation complied. And uh, mm, here we uh, come the most interesting things uh, in environmental monitoring that uh, the required lower limits of detection are usually uh, higher than minimal detectable activity of most equipment uh, that has uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, this is a very interesting situation, uh, but I will show you, uh, and uh, maybe most of you know, then, uh, for example, you want to detect uh, noble gases or carbon, or tritium, for example, usually you use the equipment um, with a very, very high um, uh, uh, compared to the levels of that radionuclides, um, minimal detectable activity. And uh, most of uh, uh, calculations of radionuclide that falling out uh, during the enterprise working are calculated, but not uh, exactly measured. Here you can see the map of nuclear power plants in the world. And uh, <clears throat> you understand that uh, the north part of our Earth is uh, more potentially dangerous uh, than the south part. Uh, and uh, that's why monitoring system in these countries, in these countries, uh, has a very, very high level. I will show you later. And uh, except Russia, uh, our environmental monitoring uh, around the nuclear power plants and nuclear facilities 
uh, usually uh, the results of that monitoring are just uh, less than, than uh, minimum detectable activity or for all radionuclides. Uh, the most important radionuclides that uh, have to be measured are inert radioactive gas or noble gases, tritium and carbon-14. Uh, this task uh, nowadays uh, is very important and interesting uh, because, as I said before, a uh, very small amount of countries has the equipment that can detect uh, that levels that uh, flow out from, for example, nuclear power plant, uh, ordinary uh, works. And uh, noble gases are the parent radionuclides for cesium, for example, and other um, long life uh, radionuclides with long uh, life, and uh, to detect the small increasing level is very, very important. For example, <clears throat> the contribution of noble gases in the total normalized uh, discharge activity. You can see that it is uh, around 90% uh, for the reactor type RBMK and 70% uh, for reactor type uh, VVR. And uh, mm, it is a, a normal uh, process of working these of these uh, reactors types. And you can see uh, the carbon 14 has the second place and uh, the tritium the third and others, others radionuclides that are usually measured during the environmental monitoring uh, uh, has just the smallest part of uh, the total uh, contribution uh, of radioactive elements to the environment. Tritium, uh, very important radionuclide because it has uh, natural and technogenic um, <clears throat> sources. Uh, maybe you know that uh, tritium is not uh, very dangerous for people. And uh, the half-life of it is not very long. And uh, the biological half-life uh, from uh, the person is very, very fast. Uh, you can, uh, if you, for example, drink uh, the solution with tritium, you will um, be clean during two days, uh, absolutely clean. But tritium, uh, and uh, it's very important radionuclide because uh, it uh, migrates very well uh, in, the, in any part of environment, in water, in air, Yes, and uh, maybe you know, for example, that uh, Fukushima plans to, to put to the ocean millions tons of tritium, but AEA uh, gave them the permission for that. And just because uh, the dangers of tritium is very small, but uh, tritium, can be a very good uh, marker and tracer to investigate uh, geographical processes. And uh, <clears throat> the problem is that tritium is very difficult uh, to detect. You know that it has uh, free forms and uh, uh, it is not too easy to analyze tritium correctly. And uh, the one of the aim of this presentation is to show you that uh, tritium should be included to the uh, normal environmental monitoring around the nuclear power plants. And it, it should be uh, detected correctly and not just less than minimum detectable activity as usual. For example, tritium uh, released into the atmosphere in the up uh, 
graph, uh, you can see uh, the permitted level, for example, and actual level in Belayarsk, uh, Belayarsk nuclear power plant, Mayak mm, plant, and Russian Federal Nuclear Center, uh, NIPF. Uh, you can see that, for example, for nuclear power plant, uh, the real level is uh, too smaller uh, than uh, the permission level. But for the enterprise, for enterprises, uh, the levels are comparable. And uh, here you can see um, the uh, discharges with uh, wastewater into the open hydrographic uh, network. Uh, permitted level and actual level in different enterprises. And uh, you should understand uh, then that uh, if tritium are going to the water, it can uh, migrate very well and achieve, for example, oceans. Yes, according to the river uh, system, and it can um, migrate to the ocean very, very fast. Uh, for example, here you can see the median specific activity uh, in European. Oh, median specific indicators of tritium discharges from European nuclear power plants. They saw the Russian nuclear power plants and enterprises. This is European. Different reactor types. You can see, um, for example, for gas cooled reactors, um, the levels are, are higher than for other uh, types of reactors. And uh, these uh, data shows uh, the ordinary um, process of uh, uh, nuclear power plants and reactors operating it is not a accident situation uh, this is the situation that we should uh, control very carefully because uh, the small increasing of level of tritium for example can show us and uh, that some accidents can occur okay uh yeah and total contribution of uh, carbon and tritium to effective dose from various uh, nucleus installations. Also different reactor types. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, in uh, the heavy water reactor, uh, more than 99.99% uh, contributes uh, carbon and tritium. Mm -hmm. Median specific indicators of carbon-14 discharges from European nuclear power plants. Also, you can see uh, VVR reactor. Uh, uh, makes uh, more carbon-14 than other reactors. And uh, it is also should be noted by you if you work uh, with uh, real reactors. And uh, the contribution of carbon-14 uh, during the nuclear enterprises uh, ordinary work is very high. It, it, it can really make uh, the error to your uh, investigation uh, that you are doing with uh, carbon-14. Yeah. Conservative estimation of carbon-14 uh, release from various sources and uh, tritium. Uh, you can see the natural activity of carbon, for example, yeah, uh, can be uh, comparable with uh, carbon that uh, <clears throat> went from nuclear weapon testing. Uh, it was before 1963 year. But nowadays, uh, from 1955, uh, the carbon-14 uh, from the uh, release of nuclear power plants is uh, uh, coming yeah, to that uh, level. And uh, some days 
it will increase uh, the natural level of carbon and uh, it, it will be very important for historical and uh, other and the same situation with the tritium you can see how fast it increased and uh, the natural activity of tritium and uh, tritium from nuclear uh, the tritium from nuclear weapon testing is higher nowadays is higher that's why for example the carbon we can use now as a natural tracer but tritium is not uh, most of tritium that you can find in the earth, uh, it's the tritium uh, from uh, nuclear weapon testing sites. <clears throat> uh -huh. Maximum value of uh, radionuclides concentration in Russian nuclear power plants, uh, airborne releases. Uh, you can see in nuclear power plants, uh, from Russia, different types nuclear power plants and uh, the radionuclides. And uh, the activity in Bikiris per cubic meter that uh, produced that uh, nuclear power plants in Russia. But uh, that uh, uh, artificial radionuclides uh, is uh, one uh, part of environmental monitoring. The artificial radionuclides and uh, radionuclides that can be uh, comparable uh, with natural radionuclides. But we have another part of uh, important part of environmental monitoring is uh, natural radionuclides. For example, here you can see that comparison of cesium release uh, to the old ocean from the various sources with the content of natural, for example, potassium and, and uranium. You, you can see potassium and uranium uh, <clears throat> part of uh, the total radioactivity in the earth. Yes. And here you can see just global nuclear weapons, Chernobyl, Fukushima. This is a small part. Uh, the biggest part that uh, affect to the people in the earth uh, in the uh, that part is natural radioactivity and that's why uh, at the same time with the uh, artificial radioactive environmental monitoring uh, around uh, the nuclear power plants and storages uh, it should be um, done the natural radiation monitoring never forget about that because uh, uh, exists a lot of uh, places in the world that are, are affected very high by uh, red dawn, for example. And uh, if we not measure in Russia, we have a lot of uh, such places that have never been measured. But uh, that places are very dangerous to live. For example, in some places in Caucasus, in the south, south of Russia. And uh, this uh, problem, this task nowadays is also very actual. And uh, for example, we have big territories in Chita, Oblast, the Baikalsky Krai, near the Lake Baikal, uh, where also very, very high level, we have very high level of radon and natural radioactivity and uh, uranium decay products. But uh, the monitoring system does exist in that territories because uh, nowadays only uh, good uh, monitoring around nuclear power plants and uh, in industries are works, but not uh, for people. And of course, uh, if you make, uh, no, uh, the natural radiation monitoring, uh, you also should uh, sample all uh, samples and uh, aquatic uh, from aquatic system from terrestrial uh, system and analyze uh, different uh, products types for example <clears throat> europe has a very interesting uh, digital atlas of natural radiation and uh, everybody can uh, go to this uh, link and uh, 
take a look how it really works. Uh, it is uh, the most one of the most uh, uh, improved, the high level monitoring system in the world now. It is open source and everybody can uh, go inside and uh, take a look. The NL cosmic ray dose, indoor gamma radon, um, uranium and soil storium, potassium and others. Uh, this digital atlas of natural radiation uh, really works and it is uh, <clears throat> uh, uploaded uh, or innovate uh, as I understand every day. It's a radon problem. Next. For example, you can find in that uh, European uh, online atlas uh, indoor radon map and uh, you can uh, zoom to the high level and find your village, yeah, and uh, see the radon level. And not only radon, but other. And uh, that uh, <clears throat> type of maps, I think uh, that types of map maps should be for the whole world. And one of the tasks for the government, uh, all of the world should be creating such types of maps. Because uh, if we are not uh, speaking about enterprises, about weapons, about nuclear power plants, we're just uh, talking about natural radioactivity. And I'm absolutely sure that nat natural radioactivity uh, affect more uh, times more than uh, uh, artificial radioactivity. And uh, that's why um, you can use uh, this uh, site, this map uh, as example uh, for your countries to 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 um, to create to start uh, such projects. Let's go. Uh, the European Radiological Data Exchange Platform. Also, here you can see uh, the um, dose level for the different sites. You can see that uh, Ukraine is includes to this map and some parts of Russia. Uh, also, you can see the countries that are um, more active in uh, these uh, monitoring maps creation. Uh, Turkey includes, yeah. Uh, go to detail. What we should control during the environmental monitoring. If we want to start uh, environmental monitoring, for example, uh, around this uh, building, around this division, that we should control. Of course, uh, we should uh, control uh, natural conditions. Uh, air, soil, vegetation. Uh, and uh, here we need to sample, to take samples and analyze uh, the content of radionuclides. As I said, um, the most important radionuclides are carbon, tritium, noble gas, gases. <clears throat> because of course, everybody knows that for example, cesium, plutonium, strontium, and other artificial radionuclides are um, are very difficult to migrate. They just put to the soil part, the sorb to the soil part, uh, soil uh, or sand uh, or organic matter and never um, go away. If you, for example, measure the radionuclide content uh, here in soil near the building, you can be sure that it, it will not be changed during 30 years, hmm, maybe with a small uncertainty. But uh, gases, um, are very important. Uh, and it's just a, sam a simple example uh, how it works on the Rupur nuclear power plant in Bangladesh. Uh, you know that Russia constructed uh, nuclear power plants all over the world. And uh, this Rupur uh, nuclear power plant, uh, this is uh, 
locations of food market. Uh, when you're working with environmental monitoring, uh, you should be uh, fix uh, the situation uh, before the constructing, during the constructing something, or and uh, after the construction. Uh, only in these uh, three um, situations you can understand uh, uh, the real effect of your building your nuclear power plant or, or your storage or everything. And here you can see just uh, five points of food markets where uh, it is just uh, it is just uh, the sample how it works you can uh, to analyze and to understand uh, the real situation uh, no need to take a lot of samples you just need to take uh, some samples uh, from the food market that are people eating or from the field what people growing and uh, just to, to estimate uh, their situation in zero point. And uh, the important, uh, one of the important uh, method to control uh, the small uh, radioactive levels is uh, thermoluminescence dosimetry. Uh, nowadays, for example, in Russia, we have only two types of thermoluminescence dosimetry. But, um, for example, in the United States, uh, they make um, uh, very, very high quality uh, thermoluminescence uh, dosimetry that uh, size is less than one millimeter. And uh, you can uh, really put it... Uh, uh, anywhere, for example, your eyes, ears, and uh, tooth, uh, anywhere to control uh, the radioactivity that affect to you. Uh, as for me, I think that thermoluminescence dosimetry is one of the best way um, to control uh, small differences in, uh, in total radioactivity level that affect to you. And uh, in environmental monitoring, in ordinary environmental monitoring, uh, people um, or specialists just uh, give uh, the thermoluminescence dosimetry to ordinary people that lives in uh, the territory that you monitor and leave that dosimetry for, for example, one year. And, after, and uh, the persons, uh, they are um, going with the, that dosimetry anywhere. Uh, in home, uh, in uh, traveling, uh, anywhere, in uh, guests, uh, in their home, in the field, in the work, anywhere. And uh, the, that uh, level that you can control uh, if you give uh, these dosimeters to ordinary people, 100, for example, dosimeters, you will see uh, during one year, after one year, the real uh, radiation situation in the region. Uh, for example, <clears throat> I wanted to put that dosimeter to the dogs and uh, the dogs can uh, really indicate yeah, uh, the territory uh, with a good quality. At the, okay, air monitoring. Air monitoring is also a very modern, interesting uh, thing, uh, theme, because nowadays a lot of countries has, uh, for example, accelerator mass spectrometry. It is not Russia. In Russia, we have only one in Novosibirsk, uh, and uh, it uh, works not uh, very, very well, but... Uh, we're improving that. But for example, in China, um, they has about 100 uh, accelerator mass spectrometers. And uh, that's why um, using that equipment, we can indicate 
very, very small levels of, for example, iodine, or one to nine, one to seven, and other radionuclides uh, that have never been analyzed before. Uh, actinides in the seawater, for example, neptunium, curium, americium, in that levels that uh, we have never indicated before. And uh, that's why um, aerosol air monitoring is uh, one of the important uh, parts of monitoring because uh, using uh, air monitoring, you can see uh, the, you can indicate the incidence uh, very, very far from the point that you take sample. I usually use uh, result filters, plant tables, and uh, volume activities. Atmospheric air sampling points around the Rupur nuclear power plant. Uh, when you plan to take uh, air samples, you should uh, note the winds, of course. This is first parameter uh, that you should note the wind and uh, the strange of, uh, of that wind and the directions, of course but also no need a lot of points because if you have good quality equipment uh, to, to find uh, the contamination, uh, no need to take a lot of samples. Soil monitoring, uh, it's organic horizons and mineral horizons are matter. Other things are not uh, important during the monitoring. Of course, if you make uh, the scientific investigation, uh, you should uh, understand all soil processes. But for environmental monitoring, you should understand just organic mineral. Because uh, I think uh, most of you know that uh, most part of radioactivity exists in the organic uh, top horizon. And the two, to estimate very fast the situation, the radioactive situation, uh, in the soils, you need just to analyze the top organic horizon. Vegetation monitoring uh, also is very important because of uh, the trophic chain and uh, through the vegetation, the radionuclides can go to the animals and to the people. But I think it is also not surprised that the percent of uh, the coefficient of migration from the soil to vegetation is less than 1%. And uh, that's why a lot of territories around Chernobyl, for example, that uh, have been contaminated now are using as uh, uh, land uh, fields for. <clears throat> Uh, you understand uh, for yes okay uh, fauna monitoring um, of course firstly it is important to take uh, fauna that uh, is eatable for people and for environmental monitoring uh, it works uh, in that way for example in the fish analyze only uh, top part the the back of fish because it is eatable in the mammals as well uh, you should analyze uh, firstly the part that uh, people eats and uh, uh, and uh, you will see very fast uh, the real uh, environment radioactive situation in mammals and the fish but also, I want to say that the coefficient, the uh, transport coefficient uh, from, veget from soil to vegetation and to animal is very, very small. To vegetation, less than 1%. And to the mammals, uh, around 1% from that 1% from vegetation. That's why um, usual, usual uh, animals and usual vegetation and uh, in around Fukushima, around Chernobyl, Fukushima and Chernobyl are not dangerous for people. 
that. Uh, water sampling uh, around the Rupur nuclear power plant. Here you can see a lot of samples just because uh, uh, the water flowing way is the most popular way of radium clouds migration. And during the nuclear power plant uh, working, um, a lot of uh, waste and liquid waste appears. And uh, water is uh, uh, one of the best way uh, to use it, the river to use it as a storage for liquid uh, nuclear waste that has small radioactivity level, uh, that has levels uh, less than permitted in the country. And that's why it is important to control uh, the water of river before uh, the nuclear power plant and after nuclear power plant. Uh, if you analyze water, uh, really works now only one way uh, for concentrate radionuclides from water is uh, co-precipitation with iron. Nowadays, uh, this way is, is the best and the one way to concentrate in very, very fastly uh, actinides radionuclides from uh, water. It is uh, very easy and uh, everybody can do it uh, in the field conditions. <clears throat> and uh, we work, for example, with uh, very big volumes of seawater uh, or uh, lake water. And we analyzed and compared a lot of methods how to concentrate actinides and the technetium and iodine for example, and uh, this iron method works better than others. Uh, here are the um, actinides concentration procedure in uh, the scheme. It is also very easy uh, to do. And uh, this method is uh, the modern, one, because uh, you can see, use here the resins, the and true resins, and uh, this um, separation of uh, actinide separation using resins. Uh, nowadays, in this is uh, the most modern method, of course, uh, and uh, no need to use uh, electro um, precipitation, electro deposition, and uh, this is uh, you just use uh, the filters to co-precipitate uh, separated purificated radioactinides and measure on alpha spectrometry. As I understand, we have no time. Yes. And uh, because I have uh, that part of uh, the election is about uh, radioanalytical methods, how to analyze everything. Because uh, here in the uh, radiochemistry department, we can analyze everything and everywhere. Yeah, we can take uh, any sample. It doesn't matter, uh, animal or people part, or I don't know, uh, soil, organic, uh, inorganic, uh, and uh, analyze uh, any radionuclides. And we have a lot of different methods, uh, radioanalytical methods, how to do it. And uh, uh, I, I don't know, but maybe next time uh, we will uh, make uh, the alpha practice practice for you because I think it is uh, the most interesting, yeah, thing. Uh, but I, I can show you different uh, methods how to purificate different actinides and how to analyze it. But I think uh, the time is over. But uh, uh, somebody after me should. Uh... Ah, I think no need uh, because the presentation is really long. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, take a rest because uh, it was uh, two or three lectures, yeah, uh, one by one. Take rest. And I will continue with you at. Uh, 
Free 40. Yeah. Free 40, you have a lecture about uh, non destructive methods. Uh, and we can discuss, I can uh, talk with you about uh, that analytical methods or destructive as well. Yeah. Or undestructive methods. Or we can just talk about everything. Okay. Thank you very much. Questions? The yes, do share the slides. Yes. Thank you for the presentation. I only want to ask about uh, how dangerous is uh, tritium to to see wildlife, see um, fishes, and all this. How dangerous is the presence of tritium in, in water for fish and all this? Fish and snails, whales, and all. The release of uh, tritium into water, into sea, how dangerous it is it to fish? Uh, but depends on the activity, the concentration. Everything depends on concentration. But um, fish uh, has a very, very high biological half-life. You know that uh, biological half-life uh, usually faster than real half-life of radioactive elements. For example, if you, uh, your fish are living in contaminated lake, the biological half-life are equal to the radionuclide half-life. But if you take your fish and put it to the clean lake, the biological half-life will be 10 uh, times higher. And uh, it depends on the environment where fish living. If fish or, or people, for example, people, yes, if they are living in the contaminated area and it's... Uh, Every day, the contaminated food, the biological half life are equal to the radionuclide half life. But just if uh, the people go to the clean city, uh, for example, for cesium, the biological half life, uh, you know, that uh, half life of cesium is 30 years, but biological half life is two months. Uh, and if you just go to go to another clean city, your biological half life will increase uh, times. And uh, it, it works for, uh, for any uh, life in the world and for any radionuclides. Yeah. And so we also have a question from Laura. Uh, so thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting. I want to ask you, uh, if in your organization you have experience in sharing the data and maps of natural radiation with the public, meaning programs of public engagement, and uh, that kind of activities, uh, activities from which we may learn. In Russia, in Russia we have no such uh, um, programs, uh, unfortunately. But I hope we will. Yeah, it's one of my dreams to make uh, the radioactive map of Russia and the artificial and the natural radioactive map of Russia. Because you know that uh, the Soviet Union legacy uh, will have uh, too, too many uh, radioactive contaminated sites that, that are not to work, so it's just legacy. But we have to uh, map that points. Uh, everybody should know uh, the levels of uh, radioactivity there. Uh, in Russia now we have only uh, online map 
that creates a rosatum uh, and it uh, indicates the dose rate, online dose rate uh, near the uh, nuclear enterprises. And that's it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, no more? Okay, thank you very much, Natalia. So, we have a break. Thank you.
Michael Ivanovich, good afternoon. Uh, good, af good afternoon to everyone. Good day to everyone. Uh, can you let me share my screen? Because on the screen you have something different. Yeah, yeah, I already share. No, no, no. Uh, okay, let me let me check. Yeah. No, I'm disabled. Ah, just a second. Uh, yeah, please check it. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's better. It's better. Just a moment, please. Have you got it? Yeah, perfect. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, dear participants, good day to everyone. I have today two lectures, and that one that you already saw about cementation will be given tomorrow, tomorrow morning. The first lecture will be mine. So today I will uh, I will uh, start. Um, so I have two lectures. The first one is about classification of radioactive waste. You see the title, and also about sealed radioactive uh, sources, car, um, uh, its categorization, actually. So um, uh, you, you, you can see here my, my, my name, my affiliation. I'm affiliated with this university, but also with the Department of Materials of Imperial College London. And also, I am leading the, 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 the journal um, Science and Technology of Nuclear Installation. So that's about introduction from my part. So I see, I see the room, I see many participants. I, I'm giving the lecture in, in English. I'll try not to be very quick. Uh, if, if something will happen, then, then you, you, you may stop and ask me something. But I plan in, to work with you in such a way that, oops, okay. That I will, I will give you the, the information in, um, or the first lecture. Then I will make a short break, something about five minutes, just to let you have a breath. Uh, and then I will continue with another one, with another one, which is on treatment. And uh, um, uh, the, the, the cementation, which is immobilization, will be given tomorrow, will be given tomorrow. So uh, today in, in the first my lecture, I, I will uh, distract you a little bit with the uh, scheme of classification of radioactive waste. Some examples you see here, but then I will move to another topic, which is not classification of the waste. I will speak with you about sealed radioactive sources. Because if you will not work for nuclear industry, if you will work for medicine, for another branches of the industry, you very probably will deal with the sealed radioactive sources, which are used practically everywhere in the world. And I already saw the list here. You are from different continents, different countries. And what is common, the nuclear power plants are not everywhere. Research reactors, not everywhere. but in practice, sealed radioactive sources, they are everywhere in every country, you know, in the medicine and in the industry and so on. And after the usage of these devices, they are also in form of radioactive waste. So what to do with the waste? And this is very important. I will give this information to you. So I'm, I'm advertising, you see, the content of, of my first lecture here. Of course, everywhere conclusions and even a kind of reference. Uh, some, some titles you will see along my presentation. Uh, let me check also to be correct with the time uh, to, to, to check it. Okay, so um, let's start, let's start uh, with the radioactive waste. So once we work with radioactive materials or some nuclear installations, inevitable, we produce some waste. And if you work in a nuclear power plant, initially all kinds of the waste which are produced during the working in a nuclear power plant, they are called radioactive waste. But then, then we check. And if the radioactivity is not high there, if the content of radio implies the same as background, then this is just waste. If not, this is radioactive waste. It is important to know the definition. So you see here in this slide, in this slide, you see here the, the, the you know, they call it a kind of basic safety standard, basic safety standard. So it's a kind of Bible. Uh, it, 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 the revised version was published in 2014. It, 
it's a kind of the book. It can be downloaded, but this is really a, a Bible for everyone who works in nuclear, not necessarily dealing with the base. So you can find all kind of definitions, regulations, and so on and so on, basis of that here, numerical even here, right? So you see here the definition, what is IF2 based? So the definition looks a little bit strange. So for legal and regulatory purposes, material for which no further use is foreseen, so is debased, but for legal and regulatory purpose, purpose, if the material contains or is contaminated with radionuclides at activities concentration greater than clearance levels, as established by authorities. So dear, 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 dear participants, some of you, you, you work and maybe you already heard about this. You know, in reality, everything around us is radioactive. Everything, including our bodies. We, we have a lot of carbon-14 in our tritium and other things. It's, a, it's a, a lot of noise nowadays that the Japanese are discharging, you know, the tritiated water or a little tritium that is there into the sea. But everybody is forgetting that even we. The tritium is actually a natural occurring radium light. It is continuously generated in the upper layers of atmosphere. I'm not speaking about the charges that also occur. Yeah, so, um, so um, uh, you know, only in the case when in the material we have concentrations higher than so-called clearance levels, and each country establishes these clearance levels as they want. The basis are given by IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency. But only in the case when we have content of radium flies in the waste, in the waste higher than these clearance levels, this waste is called, is terms, is defined as radioactive waste. And then all kinds of the stuff start to, to, to occur. So you see here, and it's a cover of a book here, this is a kind of overviews in, in the world. So we have two kinds of materials here in this slide. We have waste, and my lecture is about the waste, but also we have useful radioactive materials, right? What to do with them? How to manage them? So we have clearance. If the content is below clearance level, then we treat this material as normal, normal. We, we don't care about the radioactivity because in reality, in the walls, in the tables, in everything in our bodies, we have some radioactivity. And most probably, the life will not exist without this very little radioactivity. It's very important. Then we can have authorized discharge. So some, some effluents with the very low concentration, let's say, of radioactive noble gases or a little tritium, they are come to reactors. They discharge a little, you know, this radioactivity in the environment because it is established. We, we, we live in 21st century. We, we, we know a lot of data and material that we know what is safe, unsafe, and so on and so on. So I'm not speaking about the, the, the accidents, catastrophe, and so on and so on. I speak about the regular discharge, which will not cause any kind of harm. Then we have this authorized discharge. And if not, then we go to regulated disposal. So we need to deal with radioactive waste management. So the next slide. When we speak, we have, like in this slide, it is shown two kinds of activities. Administrative, right? Administrative. If some of you are already working or are going to work in regulatory authorities and some, some commissions and regulatory authorities who establish regulations, guidances, and so on and so on. So you deal mainly with administrative activities and in the management of radioactive materials, radioactive waste. Or, or, here are operational activities. So if you work for the nuclear industry, maybe, or even in medicine, maybe that you will deal, you will deal with some operational activities with radioactive waste. Then you have radioactive waste management as operation. You will do predisposal where you have processing, storage, transport, and then you have in, in the processing, pretreatment, treatment, conditioning. So today I'll speak in the next lecture about pretreatment and treatment and tomorrow about conditioning. So you have two kinds of activities, administrative and operational activities. So once we have to deal with radioactive waste, we need to have well-determined terms, well-determined language in dealing with radioactive waste. And here I'm coming to the classification of radioactive waste. So classification of radioactive waste is very important 
Because you see that th there is a table with many things. So first of all, in the left column of the table, the classification provides input for national radioactive waste management policy and strategy. So even you know to the higher levels of administrative, you know, ministries and so on and so on, they also deal with classification. We should inform them how much waste do we have, what kind of size of the waste management facility do we need, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you, I, I, I know there are people here from, from Belarus. They, they, they started to operate very recently a nuclear power plant. So they have a, a country radioactive waste management policy and strategy and all kinds of, of, of management programs there and so on and so on. And, and the people who operate should inform the administrative organizations about the, the, So they should use this language. And then terminology, broad indication of potential hazards, systematic foundation for waste segregation and management programs, disposal route for the waste, an efficient management system for operators. So you see here the, the, the questions and what kind of information it's important and why we need the classification. So when we start to classify, to use classification of radioactive waste, we use, we apply terms that are usual. So origin, where this waste is coming from? It's from nuclear fuel cycle, it's from isotope production, or maybe it's coming from a mine, maybe it's coming from something which is in the nature, and I will inform you about the double standards. That this is very important. It's very important because nuclear industry is discriminated and the restrictions are very, very strong. And if the material is coming not from nuclear industry, then the people, everybody, you know, this is from nature, it's not so hazardous, and et cetera, et cetera. But it is for general public. In reality, radiation is radiation. Okay, physical state, we, we will classify, of course, the waste it's solid, it's liquid, it's gaseous. And we will need to measure activity concentration. This is something which is already specific, specific to radioactivity, right? To nuclear waste. And in, in, in the waste management, nuclear waste and radioactive waste, they are synonyms. It's, it's the same. So I'm using these terms and in papers and reports, nuclear waste, radioactive waste is the same. Uh, so uh, here we will we will uh, uh, use you know low level, intermediate level, high level, the definition a little bit later. And house life. Once the radionuclides are decaying, naturally decaying, they disintegrate this time. We need to know how rapidly occurs this process. So it's a fast one, then short-lived radionuclides, it's it's a it's a lengthy process, then we deal with the long-lived waste, and these things are specified later. So how they are specified, you know, historically classification started to, to be developed in, 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 in big countries, nuclear power, historically, immediately after, after the, 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 the development of nuclear industry. Uh, but this time, uh, it was understood that we need a kind of convergence and kind of, of a generic approach to be used everywhere. And here, International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, where I worked for eight years as a staff member. So this is international organization that, that, that helps everywhere countries in the world to, to, to properly manage, the, 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 to properly use the, the, the nuclear energy, including management of radioactive waste. So the, the, the uh, IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, has developed a generic scheme, which is recommended to everyone, to all countries, to be used. And the schematic of this scheme, it is here. So the IAEA recommends, recommends to classify the radioactive waste accordingly with two parameters. The first one, it's activity content. And IAEA understands under activity content, the total content, how much in total we have radioactive material. And also concentration, how concentrated it is. And this is vertical axis. And along the horizontal axis is the half life. And then we start to move upward. So first we have, we have got exempt waste. This is the material which contains radioactivity because everything around us is radioactive. That, that the, the universe was created as a, as a very radioactive. 
during the expansion, the, the, the short lived decay, then etc. Cetera, et cetera. So everything around us is a little radio. So the uranium we extract from, from mines, it is in the nature, it's not created by us. So we, we just smartly use it. So produce other radiators and accelerators and etc. Then we have got here very low level, low level, intermediate level, and high level. And uh, the, 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 you see here that in, in, in this uh, IAE document, classification of radioactive waste, it's the, 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 the definition of all these terms. So it's the same plot. It's just to show to you a little bit more exactly. So we got here half-life and we got here a line, which is 30 years. So it was generically agreed that if the half-life of decaying radionuclides is less than 30 years, more exactly 30.2 years, so that includes cesium-137, then these radionuclides are conventionally termed short-lived, and we say short-lived waste, so less than 30 years. If longer, then we say long-lived waste. So we have here this, this splitting in 30, less than 30 years and more than 30 years, as short-lived and long-lived. And then we have these things that are already noted to you, exempt. Then we got very low level, low level, intermediate level, high level. And the IEA classification schemes determines by recommends the disposal route. So if this exempt waste, this is conventionally said, this is non-radioactive waste. If you are a scientist in this room, everybody has it's, it's a technical education and understands that there is a little radioactivity everywhere. But conventionally we say that the waste, which contains something a little bit nevertheless, is non-radioactive waste. So nobody cares. From the point of view of radioactivity, of course, can be toxic metals there, chemicals, and so on and so on. Are the, environmental agencies that care about Ministry of Health, they care about. So when I say no care, it means from the point of view of radiological hazard, our business is not to care about that. Then for very low level waste, uh, landfill disposal is recommended as very safe one. So we are a little bit above the clearance levels. Then low level waste near surface disposal facilities. Intermediate depth is for intermediate level waste and high level waste only, only deep geological disposal. That's classification scheme that comes from IAEA. Uh, so once again, you see here, I put some text in my slides to explain to you what is what. So what is short lived waste? So no significant levels of radionuclides is half lives greater than 30 years. This is short-lived waste. Long-lived waste, we have significant content greater than 30 years. And um, uh, 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 here, there is coming from IEA from Vienna, some numerical parameters. And you see here that typical limitations are 4,000 decal per gram in an individual waste package or Average per, per, per facility, per disposal facility, not more than 400 decal per gram. So these are typical numbers that come from the agents. In reality, if you work in, in, in dedicated organizations in your country, please, please take into account that these numbers are not generically varied everywhere. You can find through the safety analysis that your facility in your country, you can have maybe 10 times more than it is indicated here. So these are quite conservative numbers that agency recommends, but they, they are with a great, great reserve given. And in the safety analysis report, you can derive and obtain numbers which are much are different from this. Take this into account. Okay, so now we move to the very short read. So what is very short, uh, very short waste? If you have the house lives, which are much less than one year, which are a couple of months, then we, we can afford just to wait for the natural decay to occur and not to use all the scheme of management of the waste. 
So this is very short-lived waste. And then if you have very low level waste, so it's radionuclides that the decay time takes longer, but you are a little bit above the clearance levels, or they are called exemption levels here. You see here, this plot, a little bit higher. And the exemption levels, which are recommended by the IDEA, and which are used everywhere in the world, practically without change. There are some changes, but not everywhere and very little. They are extremely conservative. They are extremely conservative, so they, they are not safe. They're absolutely safe with the very high degrees, which is 100 times. So because of that, if you are a little bit above them, there is not a real hazard from the point of view of radiological hazard. And because of that, landfill disposal provides enough, enough level of safety. So this is a recommendation, right? Then we move to the low level waste. So the activities are enough high to harm the environment and the, the, the people. But there is no need for, for shielding. There is no need for, 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 a, for a substantial shielding. There is no need for, for to take care about the heat release and the waste and so on. And in total, the, 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 the time of the full decay of radionuclides to the background level, it's something less than 1,000 years, several hundred years. Then near surface disposal is permitted, is recommended, and this is for low level waste. So you are above by the content of radioactivity, above the very low level waste, but still no need for substantial shielding and, and no need for to take care about, about the heat release. So we are coming now to the intermediate level waste. Intermediate level waste, you see here a long, a long description of this waste. So the point is that in this waste, you can have content of radionuclides, which have the, the decay time longer than thousands of years. In total, you need to store this waste to put in a disposal facility for longer than many hundred years. And during such extended period of storage, everything can happen. Because of that, we have to go deeper. We have to go deeper than, than let's say, many hundreds, may, hundreds of, of, of meters. So maybe um, around 100 meters. So these are called intermediate depths. Intermediate depths. So for, 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 for these uh, uh, times of, uh, of storage, we can uh, warranty that uh, nothing will happen to the disposal facility. And because of that, we can go with the intermediate level waste to, to these steps. And finally, we have the high level waste, high level waste. So we have here activity concentration so high that we need shielding. Shielding because radiation is too high. Maybe remote control of this waste and also substantial heat release. So substantial that we need to count that overheating can occur and that, 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 that can destroy that can, um, because of this overheating in a geological formation have thermal effects very substantial. So this is high level waste. And we must go to the deep geological disposal because from geology, from this branch of science, we know that only if you are deeper than several hundred meters, 300, 500, only in this case, in stable geological formation, we are sure that during the, 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 the hundred thousands of years, millions of years, this formation will stay stable, nothing will occur, and these radionuclides will not be by natural processes delivered back to, to the biosphere. And because of that, we must go to the deep geological formation. This is generic consensus achieved everywhere in the world that for high level waste, the only route of disposal is deep geological disposal. They are called um, GDF, so geological disposal facilities. Okay, so let me distract a little bit. This is a kind of technical anecdote. It's not a pleasant one, I'm sorry. Uh, so um, so it's, it's about the old, old classification, which was in place up to 1994. You see here the document of agency. And the anecdote is that Unfortunately, as low intermediate level waste, in the IAE document, it was indicated the two kilowatt per cubic meters allowed up to, up to two kilowatt per cubic meters heat release. 
And I, I, I personally, not only myself, I was in, in, in a big documentary fight with the expert from IEA indicating that this is not simple, hard. This is, can lead to a catastrophe, to a catastrophe. So uh, if you'll accumulate with such cheap release a large amount of the waste, you can obtain even meltdown, meltdown. And finally, in the current, in the current, you see here this current, the guide in place, uh, generic safety guide one, we have instead of kilowatt, just few watt, 1000 times less, you understand? So, you know, sometimes happens that even at IAEA, the experts, which are recognized experts, that develop these documents, in the documents, we can have mistakes. I don't know, misprint or what, but kilowatt instead of the watt, in reality, could cause a real catastrophe. So um, how I came to, 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 to this point, this is uh, these two known experts from Russian Federation, so uh, Dr. Vladimir Kashev and uh, late Professor Pavel Polektov, we started to develop it, the concept of cell disposal. So if you put too much radium nucleides in a capsule, because of overheating, this capsule will sink down, sink down. So the proposal is to be not far from Hawaii, to put here the capsule and to leave it because because of our heating it will start to melt to melt the, the, the rock and get onto the mantle that's it full story and by the way it was a movie i couldn't see maybe is anyone from china in the room it was a movie some 40 years ago it was called china syndrome so the the, the story fantastic story was well, like in chernobyl that in in a, in a core of a reactor in china it started to melt and by melting, it went down also into the man. So uh, there is even a cartoon here. And this is a paper from a scientific journal. It's, it's co-authored by me as well. You see here, this is my name. So these are calculations. And we proposed actually this capsule not for the disposal. We proposed these capsules for investigations of deep layers of the earth, which are unknown. They cannot penetrate into the mantle till today. Till today, there, there are no devices to get into the mantle. And we proposed with these two professors from, from, from Russia uh, to, 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 to use these capsules to, to get down, to put some, some acoustic emissions detectors here and to investigate what's happening in the mantle of, of the Earth. So till now, the project was, was not moving ahead. There were only scientific conferences and so on and so on for real information. OK, so that was the anecdote. And the, the, the bad side of this anecdote that this was a catastrophic mistake. Now is corrected, but be careful with the IA documents. Some of them are obsolete, are not correct. So use just you know current the current document. This one can be downloaded. This this document, but is obsolete and contains a mistake. Two kilowatt per cubic meter is too high. Too high. Okay. So um, a short comment about naturally occurring radioactive materials. I I should inform you that. Practically everywhere in the world, with the exception of several countries, there is a double standard. And for naturally occurring radioactive materials, let's say for if you have the ash, which comes from the burning of the coal at, at power generating plants, you know, the, the, the burned coal to obtain electricity, and we have nuclear power plants to obtain electricity. So the ash, which is produced by other industries, it is treated. There is a big discount. So the activity there is 100 times higher, and nobody says this is radioactive waste. If the same material it is brought under the fence of nuclear power plant, immediately will be very radioactive, and a lot of care should be. So you see here the information about that. So um, natural occurring radioactive materials, there are residues, the emissions are given here. So some of them are really radioactive waste, even using double standard even using double standard. So on, 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 on the classification scheme, these materials are here in this part. So um, uh, some examples, because I need to move to the, to the second part about the, the, the sealed radioactive sources. So um, in many countries, there are own systems. Uh, th this book contains examples on the management schemes and practices in many countries of the world, including the United Kingdom, 
Russian Federation, other countries, um, France, um, etc., etc. So it's a big book. And um, a table about classification from the United Kingdom. Uh, so you see here the same terms like in the IAEA, except that we have low volume, very low level waste, and large volume, very low level waste. Otherwise, low level waste, some numbers here are important, intermediate level, and high level. And Russian classification, you are currently in, in Moscow. So here it's about the, the, the links where this classification is given. I, I like very much this team. First of all, in Russia, in Russia, they have a very exact scheme. This, the, you see here the, 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 the category of the base and specific radioactivity. And once you have the exact numbers, you can make even an, an automatic system to classify the base. You put the numbers in, into your robotic machine and it will classify you the base. And then you need to, to, to take the waste that go to geological disposal, which is extremely expensive. Or you can leave the waste, which is low level and then surface disposal, which is 100,000 times cheaper. So that, that's important activity. Here again, the links and to pay, to attract your attention too. That in Russia, they also recommend tentative classification based on either, either, you see a dose rate, you take a dosimeter, you approach the material, you measure the dose rate, and immediately you have the, the impression, is this high level waste or low level waste? So that, according to this, these dose rates, or you take a swap, take the contamination, and again, you have tentative classification, very used of things. Uh, so let's move to the second part. So that's not classification. So the idea, the idea are participants. Uh, sealed radioactive sources. These are materials which contain radionuclides sealed inside. So you see here some photographs of these sources, which are used in order, these devices, to use radiation. So radiation which comes from these devices are, are used. And radiations can be different, you know that. So here are some tables, not to read them. So where, what kind of radionuclides it is used. So it's it's with you. So medicine, medicine. So um, gamma light. Some, some, some of sick people they, they they go to Mars, and we need to identify. And and by the way, for your information, for foreign people, not not from Russia. So you are now in the, the department of radiochemistry, right? So uh, I'm a, a member of a scientific council of this department, and I know that many PhD works are on use of radionuclides in medicine. Nuclear medicine is extremely important everywhere and you know extends our life of the humans. So there is a device which is called gamma 9. It focuses the gamma rays exactly on the tumor. So it's killing the tumor. So uh, that, that's the photograph to, to, to show you. So, but who is producing these gamma rays? In this case, gamma knife is not accelerator. It's cobalt 60. Cobalt 60, which is shielded and only for collimating cold uh, channel. The ray is coming out and is directed exactly to the tumor and is killing the tumor in such a way the patients have a, a, a health life for, for, for the rest of their life, which can be like for normal people. So, but not only, we, we have uh, devices which generate electricity in remote areas, Arctic areas, and so on, and so on, in, in cosmic space. Uh, irradiators that are used in, in science, um, that one is a Pacemaker. So you know it's it's making the heart of some patients to be normally. Otherwise, because of, of disturbances in, 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 in the pace of the uh, heart beating, they, they, they can suddenly die. So again, some some red quads are there. Well, I could also ask so if, if you have a pipe with let's say uh, oil, oil, and we know we, we need to control the quality of this voice, the, the gamma ray is passing through. through Pipe. We got here the image, a detector there, and then immediately you get that this is oil now with the water or something else there, and so on. So it's to control. That one is to control the the, the, the quality of the asphalt, let's say. So some gauges. Uh, this 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 type of device. Maybe I forgot already in the room. If you look to the ceiling, you will see the small detectors. Small detectors. They will produce alarm if the fire. And you imagine industrial buildings, that's very important. Some people are, sometimes nobody's going there. 
fire can start dying. So we have smoke detectors. Everywhere on these devices, we use radio nucleides, radio nucleides. So the radiation emitted from these devices, it's intense. And in many cases, we need a very substantial shielding. And even, even after the, the, the end of the life of the safe use of these devices, we need to manage these, these devices, which are categorized as the base. So you see here some documents, some pictures are taken from these documents, management of these used sealed radioactive sources. So these devices are called these used sealed radioactive sources. These used sealed radioactive sources. This is IA document, this is a document from the United States. So you see here the table, and here it's a table about recommended categorization for sources. And you see here five categories. And categories of sources and classification of radioactive waste is not the same. So let's look what is categorization of sources. So we have here some IA documents with the references given here. When we categorize the source, we are looking on potential of source to cause deterministic health effects. So we need to know from the point of view of operating with this material how safe we are. Because of that, because of that, the sources are categorized, not classified, categorized in five categories. So, in order to categorize the source, the IEEA, with the expert from the world, which worked for, for a long time in the agency, they defined a so-called de facto. So the, the, the so-called dangerous source. So depending on this, to compare with this dangerous source, then the five categories are defined. And here it's, it's the information that was used to define the source. So in order to define a dangerous source, the dose criteria was like a bone marrow of a human will obtain one gray in two days. One gray in two days. And you see here some other numbers, long six grays and five grays, 25 grays, one gray in 100 hours. So in categorization. I added here, I hope that other experts informed you about that if you speak about the safe conditions to operate in nuclear industry, when we don't speak about the grace in hours or days, we speak typically about millisiever, not per hour, per day. So you see here, one grain two days, one millisiever, so one thousand part. Of a, of, a, of a gray during one year, not, not two days. And we have these numbers you see here, one millisiever per for public and etc. So these are ICR, International Commission on Radiological Protection, and then IEA recommends exactly the same numbers. And I added for you, this is even for generic public, but look, these are the levels that are considered by, 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 by recommendation as safe, so maximum, Annual, annual, during one year, exposure to general public. It's one millisievert per year. And when we speak about the danger of source, we speak about levels that are really very dangerous. They are here on this table, here, very, very high. And then for different radionuclides, uh, you see here for cobalt 60, let's say, we have enterobacterials, the activity that will be for a danger of source. And that, that's a table for, for our very other. But the tables are, of course, extended. You can find them in IE documents. Also, the, the equation that should be used for a mixture of radionuclides. So all the things are, are, are given here without comments. I'm giving them to you. So uh, now, categories. So as you see, the category one, it is when the activity of the source is more than 1,000 times higher compared with the danger of source. Category two, it is between 1,000 times higher and 10 times higher, right? Uh, category three, it is in between 10 times and exactly danger of source. So you imagine these sources are really very, very dangerous. And then you have category three, so it's 1% up to one. And here, less than 1% of the dangerous source. And some text. So what is the category one source? 
in a few minutes, if you are in contact, you can get the lethal dose. So these are extremely dangerous sources. These are, are in, in, in the table, and I will show other tables. So these are sources that in, in practice, when they are used, when they are used, they are shooting. But we, we have unfortunately examples. So immediately after the, the, the Chernobyl catastrophe next year in Brazil, one of such source was extracted from the shielding and, and killed many people. And in the newspapers at that time in 1987, it, this was called the second after Chernobyl catastrophe in the war. You know, it, a large part of, of, of the city, a small city, of course, in Brazil was, everything was contaminated there. And a lot of, of, of contamination and even people that was, they, the people were killed by, by, by the radiation from this source. But then we have sector, category two, very dangerous, they are called. So in minutes to hours, the, the, the total dose can be lethal. And dangerous, it's days to weeks. So again, and unfortunately for, for, for this, we, we have examples, we have terror publications in many countries when, when, when just with the sources, the, 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 good, the, 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 the scale was not so, so large as of Chernobyl and Fukushima. Of Fukushima, nobody was killed at all, no, no, no deaths at all, and even sickness. Um, not, not registered, uh, but, but uh, in, in Chernobyl, these, these things happen. So, so even from the sources, the, 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 the very dangerous things that can happen. Okay, so then we move to the number four, unlikely to be dangerous for persons. It's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. And the category five sources, so smoke detectors, category five, right? So no likely so it's most unlikely most unlikely to be dangerous for the people because of that we don't need shielding in, in dealing with these sources and for your information not to criticize and so on and so on so it's from my country from united from united kingdom in my house i have a smoke detector i am legally allowed to change it to throw it away into the bin with the trash when will not properly work and to buy and to put another one or very service special that changes these sources. But in every house, in, in my house in, in Sheffield, I'm living in the city of Sheffield, I have uh, such a, in, in the kitchen, you know, smoke detectors because the boiler can, can generate, you know, CO2 and can generate smoke and be a fire in the house. So that, that immediately will, will, will produce a lot in, in the house. But in the United Kingdom, the industries are not allowed even category five sources to throw them into the bin. They must collect the sources and to dispose to, 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 as, uh, to deliver them to, to, to the disposal site in United Kingdom. Okay. So here is the, the, the promised table. So you see where category one, RTG, the radiators. So these are uh, uh, radionuclide thermal generators which generate electricity. So the radionuclide, strontium 90, plutonium. It is used, but a shorter lived one, not, not that one, which is for bombs. So um, 238 plutonium, it is used. And the radiators, you see here cobalt and cesium typically, and can be also category one. So in, in Goenia, it was a cesium 137 source used in medicine for, for, for irradiation and then this big catastrophe. And the, the, the IA document that, that dealt with, with these things. So that's, you see, Bone densitometry, so we, we imagine that this is from, from medicine, then some, some laboratories can use the, this radio device, and you see gradually move to the category five sources. So, uh, so um, calibration, calibration, uh, and calibration sources. So, we, if you have a dosimeter, then there is a source there in dosimeter. So, you put it near the, the calibration source to check is it operating or not your detector, right? Uh, and this source is category five, so don't don't be afraid of it. It's it's really very low activity material. Uh, so, what about classification of the source? Because things that I just introduced to you are ca categorization. So, you can consider for general public as synonym, but in, in radioactive waste management, category and class these are different things. So, what to do? We have categories of sources. You, let's say, work in a nuclear waste management organization and you have received a category one source, which looks extremely dangerous. Is it the high level waste or not? 
that's not obvious because other other things are considered in, in, in the classification. The disposal root actually. Do we need to go to the deep geological repository? And if the, the, the category one source is a very short lived one, why do you wait for a deep geological repository? We will put it in a room, wait for a couple of years, and that's it. And the, 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 the nature did for us all the job. So the kid, I mean. So in, in, in all the classification, it was nothing currently we have classification. So um, this is where some example sources are placed on categorization scheme. So uh, that's IEA classification. So some of the sources, you see here some numbers are intermediate level waste. We cannot dispose them in a near surface disposal facility by, by recommendations of agents. And you see here some numbers and the table which here you cannot read. The next slide, you, you will be able to read it, right? But some of them are low level waste. So we have no need to, to go to more expensive, to more expensive. Um, intermediate depth or, or even the geological. So, uh, the aquatics, of course, it is possible all kind of the ways to dispose off into the geological repository. The agency does not prohibit to do that. It just accounts that it's typically geological, very expensive, and uh, no need to do that. But in some countries, if they, they, they have, you know, some used mines and so on, where, where it's possible and easy to dispose of low level waste in the deep geological facility. Why not to do that? It's, it's a, so we, we can also dispose all the sources in a deep geological disposal facility, in geological disposal facility, and uh, the, 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 that will be safe from the point of view of disposal. But we, we can afford to dispose in near surface disposal some of the, the sources. And you see here, some of them are very short lived. Just wait, wait, so it's delay for decay. Just delay the disposal and they will disappear by nature. And um, it's, it's nothing here because typically, you know, we, we use sources with substantial amount of radioactivity. We, we need radiation from these sources, right? And this, this you see here, so I, I, I put in, in circle here, the, these are intermediate radioactive level, radioactive waste, these sources. But they, 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 they should be checked everywhere. So these are just examples with, with the limitations on, on the radioactivity. So if it is like in this table, then this cobalt 60 has to go to the intermediate depth disposal facility, maybe a borehole or something like that. Right. So conclusions. And then you will get a five minutes break. So classification, which is recommended by IDEA, is based on endpoint disposal route and accounts for activity level and half life. Categorization of sealed radioactive sources relates to their operational safety and security also, and is not intended to be applied for nuclear waste management. And radioactive waste classification schemes used are nationally based, nationally based. So in, in the countries, we have to check our classification which can be not exactly the same like in the agency. And I put a generic reference here where this stuff as well and other stuff that will be in the next lecture is going to be there. So dear participants here, it's five minute break, have a breath. Uh, think maybe you'll like to ask me something and then the next lecture will be a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter so that we'll be able before the lunch to ask me something if you like, of course. So five minutes break, you'll get back a drink. Thank you very much.
Yeah, colleagues, please take your seats. We'll continue. Uh, so, dear participants, now I move to the treatment. To the treatment. So, uh, once we have the radioactive waste, the end point is disposal. But we need to prepare the materials for the disposal. We, we, first of all, we, 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 we have too much material and it's too expensive to take it as is and to put it there. Then you imagine we cannot put it there as is. Some of the material is liquid. And the liquids are not allowed for the disposal nowadays. Nowadays. Uh, so, uh, but not only the volume it is too high, so we need to decrease the volume, and then they can poison the disposal facility, destroy it, and cannot be safe, safely stored for a long time, etc. So we need treatment. We need treatment. So what is in the treatment? Uh, since we have solid and liquid materials, then we will have different technologies. Uh, so uh, it's it's you see here it's um, it's uh, one lecture but you see here I put two columns for you so I will first work through share with you the information about the solid radioactive waste how to treat solid radioactive waste and then I will move to the, the treatment of uh, liquids and um, mainly aqueous so the materials on the basis of water the, the water containing liquid radioactive waste which is on the basis of the water. Uh, for 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 liquid organics, uh, but by the way, can uh, as a method incineration, which is for solid waste, can also burn the liquid spoils, some some kerosene and etc., something like that. So combine. This is the point when they are combined. So we see here. I am starting with the compaction and supercompaction, but first a little bit background. Background. The participants in the background. I put here a cover. This is an IEA safety glossary. This is a document which was published in 2019. It's, a, it's relative recently. It's a very good document with the definition of all kinds of the terms. So again, it's both for operators and regulators very good to use the terminology. Of course, it's in English. Uh, and um, you will need to translate it and to have a glossary um, in, in your native language if it is not a language of IEA. IEA has officially several languages. So Arabic is also official uh, language, and um, and um, Russian it's also official language. So we, we we got translation of some glossaries in, into into the Russian. But uh, the the language which nowadays is everywhere keeping us together is is English. It's historically because of that. So what is the processing? Any operation that changes the characteristic of the waste, including pretreatment, treatment, and conditioning. So this is the term. Which is generic one processing. Because of that, I'm using you know the processing term. So treatment, treatment, it's a part of processing. Treatment is not everything. So you know the generic terms, which in generic language, and and I'm sorry, I, I should confess to you, you know, in, in British documents which are prepared by the experts, sometimes they use treatment as instead of processing. And what to do, you know, the, the people are not aware of this glossary. Also, the glossary is in English. So um, I'm designed a little bit. So uh, treatment, what is the treatment? So these are operations, because my lecture is about treatment. These are operations that are intended to benefit safety and or economy by changing characteristics of the waste. So we have three basic treatment objectives. Volume reduction, volume reduction. Second, removal of radionuclides from the waste, removal. And three, change of composition. And sometimes after the treatment, when we get a very good quality waste form, so good that it will be immediately accepted for the disposal, transportation and disposal, sometimes only. Okay. So this is a scheme difficult to go with you, but before the liquids and for the solids, we have such schemes. So it's a roadmap. If you have the radioactive waste, which is solid, first of all, they need to characterize and segregate. And then here in this, this roadmap, it's segregation following IEA recommendation into exempt waste, very short lived, very low level, low level, intermediate level, high level. And then what to do with this waste? What to do with this waste? The end point is disposal. So, in the case of exempt waste and very short lived waste, as non radioactive material, we, we, from the point of view of radiology, don't care about the radionuclide content. It's a business of other agencies to look, maybe some chemicals are there, some biological there, and etc. From the point of view of 
radiological hazard, because decay already occurred, because the content of radionuclides is too small, we go to the disposal as non radioactive waste. And here, a kind, all kinds of the stuff, right? So SNF stands for spent nuclear fuel. No, not, not much here information about that. Also, if you ask me, I can, you know, develop this, this topic. So when we select a treatment process, we need to account for many, many things. So also, you know, if I have solid waste, which is burnable, then I will say incineration is the method to be used. But this is too simplified approach. In reality, we need to account for many, many things. Because even for burnable waste, if I have just one cubic meter of the waste for the whole country, who will give you, you know, millions of the dollars to, to, to build an incinerator and then other millions to, to operate it in order to incinerate one cubic meter of the material? So many things would be accounted for. So here you see we account for physical and chemical properties, clearance levels, discharge requirements, because if you use incineration, we will need to discharge something into the atmosphere and maybe some liquids and so on. Uh, transfer of concentration radioactivity from organic to other stable media, requirements for conditioning, requirements for processing of secondary waste, requirements for storage, transport, disposal, so many things should be accounted for. And all the things in addition to, to, to the previous slide, there is a document of the IEA recently published, relatively recently, so some six years ago. I was at that time a staff member of the IEA in Vienna. I was the leading technical officer of this project, so I, I know very well the content of this document, selection of technical solutions for the management of radioactive waste. And there is a logic scheme here, what to do with the solid waste, how to, to select the treatment method and how to get you know, to, 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 to the final product. So this is a, also a long story, but don't forget that it's not so simple to say if it is vulnerable incineration, maybe not, maybe not. So um, let's start with the compaction and super compaction as a method, because this lecture is about the methods of treatment of solid radioactive waste. So we have low force compaction and high force compaction. And typically, low force compaction, it is when the force of compaction, so the, the, the plunger which is compacting the waste, it is from 10 to 50 tons typically. So maybe 55, but something about. Then we say that this is low force compaction. But you imagine that we need very high force if you need to significantly compact the material. Then we are dealing with the high force compaction, which in our industry are called super compactors. And typically the force is 1,200 up to 2,000 tons, maybe even higher, two tons. In this case, we are dealing with the super compaction, super compaction. And for this, we have features, we have limitations of, 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 of these devices and do or not they produce secondary waste. And if you use super compaction, the force is so high that if in the waste there is some water, can be wet soil, can be some oils in, in, the, in the waste, then this material liquid is squeezed. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, coming out of, of the pellet which is produced and then liquid waste can be produced. So we start with the, the, the low force compaction and even here we have two types can be in drum compaction. So the plunger, it's entering into the drum and pressing the waste. And this is done several times in order to put in a drum, several portion of the waste because this drum is large and after compaction, we will have a, a layer which is, it, it, the, 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 the height is much less than the height of the drum. Or can be, can be so-called drum crushing devices when the drum together with the waste is pressed into a panel. So this is the uh, photograph of uh, these uh, in drum compactors, which press, so this plunger will enter into the drum, will press the waste in, inside, and then the operator will put other bags, and we will go several times until the, the drum is filled in. Every time the, the chamber it is closed, every time it is done inside so that the operator is not breathing all kind of the dust that is coming within the compaction, so this is done by opening and, and that, so it's for low level waste, definitely. Um, 
and we have drum crushing when uh, we, we, we press the waist together with the drum, we need higher force. So this is a photograph of such type of the devices. And in both cases, we need to keep the pressing chamber under negative pressure and to care about generation of aerosols. During the compaction, some aerosols will be inevitably generated. First of all, the air, which is in the gaps, pores, in between the waste, it, it's pumped out of the waste, right? And it takes this, 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 this air jets, all kinds of the dust and so on and so on. So it's radioactive. Need to be careful. Because of that, negative pressure and filtration, filtration of aerosols. So we have some HEPA filters on the back of this compaction chamber. The, 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 the photograph is taken by the way. So these are my own photograph in Azerbaijan. If anyone is from, from Azerbaijan, you, you can recognize your devices if you are from, 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 from this organization, right? Um, here, it's uh, a photograph of super compactors. So these are typically 1,200, 1,500 uh, tons, tons, and the volume reduction factor is much higher. Can be seven, can be 15, can be even up to 100. It depends on kind of the base to be compact. If it is some concrete there and so on and so on, we cannot contact it too much, right? But if it is, if it is um, something with the high porosity, then, then we, we, we can eliminate this porosity and can produce a very compacted material. Uh, the, 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 the compaction, super compaction technology, it is, I'm, I'm simplifying things, I'm, I'm paying attention to the, the, the views that you, you get from me are helicopter views of these things. So this is a schematics, how to do. We generate secondary waste, we need to treat. So it is oil to incinerate in this waste. So this is a schematic taken from this book where details on this technology are presented, right? So these are photographs taken not far from Moscow. There is, there is a city which is, has the name Sergei Posad. I worked for 20 years in an organization in Russia. It is the name Radon, now belongs to the Rosatom, Rosatom who is organizing this international school. So this is a preparatory room, preparatory area, where in 100 drums, the waste is, is placed and waiting the campaign of super compassion. And this is what we obtain after super compassion. Pellets. Uh, this is taken from Slovakia. We got participant from Slovakia. So uh, this is a super compactor, and these are the pellets. And I put it here, to, so you see here 2,000 tons. Volume reduction statistically uh, reported from four to eight, four to eight, uh, up to 10 drums per hour can be super compacted. And the pellets have different height. It depends what do we have inside, what they had inside, what kind of the Of course, everything is measured before, after is characterized. So characterization is present everywhere at every single step of, of the radio waste management, including. Then we measure again what is the volume, what is the radioactivity, doses, and, and so on and so on. These are the pellets. So now we go to another topic. And the topic here is called thermal treatment. And I saw in the program of the school that you will have dedicated lectures on the thermal treatment of radioactive waste. Because of the way that, because of that, the, 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 my, my excursion into the thermal treatment will be quick and will be this helicopter view. You will be able to, to, to get more detailed information. Uh, in the program, you, 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 you got uh, Mr. Mikhail Polkanov, who is working in Radon. I worked with him for, for, for 20 years, and I know him very well. He is a, is a knowledge expert in, in thermal treatment technologies. He is frequently invited by the IEA is an expert, international expert, to, to deliver uh, his expertise to international community. So, so you will get from, from, from it doesn't mean I, I don't know things about the term, so, but you will get the, the, the information in, in the first hands on the technologies that are, are used and facilities are used and the other things that I, I, I was developing and some use, you, get, you can get from me as well, of course. But we know each other, so it's it's so in the thermal treatment technologies, we have here uh, uh, typical technologies that are used. The first one is incineration. Then we got pyrolysis. So this is something like 
incineration, but without access of oxygen. So uh, the temperature is there, but oxygen is not there to, to, to complete the burning, the, the oxidation of the material. So that is pyrolysis. Uh, plasma treatment, when, when by, by, by using plasma torch, we are able to, 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 to increase the temperature to many thousand degrees and in such a way to treat everything, you know, in one step by using plasma. Uh, metal melting, uh, also it's a technology, thermal technology, which is used only for, for the metal stream of radioactive waste. And it is nowadays used on a large scale in the decommissioning projects. So if you, if you have it like in Slovakia, like in Lithuania, in, 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 in the countries where the commission projects underway, then thousands and thousands of tons of metals are released for, for free release or for uh, reuse everywhere because the, after the, the metal melting, the material produced is typically, most typically, 99.99 of the material. It is non radioactive and it is cleared by, by the authorities and can be freely used everywhere. So that's metal melting. So um, the, 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 the first technology is incineration. And um, in, in, in the slides, which will be repeated tomorrow, or when you will get the lecture from Polkanov, then, then you will see the, the, some pictures and tables from, from, him, from his publications, by the way, um, um, some from my publications. Uh, what is incineration? So uh, it's a well-proven technology, very high volume reduction of the, uh, the, the process waste. Uh, through output is high. Continuity of the process can be used for both solid and liquid. So incineration can be used not only for solid radioactive waste, but for burnable radioactive waste. And even some, some, some water containing materials, because solid waste is wet waste, can be incinerated, of course. And, and uh, uh, some organics which contain water can also uh, uh, be incinerated in, in, a, in, a, in an incinerator, which, which have uh, the, 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 some of the torches supplied. Uh, with the possibility to inject their the, 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 the liquids. Uh, here, of course, uh, some limitations. And um, what do we produce? We produce secondary waste in form of off gases into purified off gases. Some scrubbing solutions, uh, some filters not noted here, but the, some solid material can be also used. Oops. So um, the highest volume reduction it is achieved using incineration. And um, the, the form is suitable for subsequent immobilization and disposal. So uh, typically, we produce the ash uh, apart for, uh, from our advanced incinerator, incinerators. Um, uh, so that typically, if it is not advanced incinerator, then the, the waste which is produced after incineration is ash, ash. At least the ash is non burnable but we need either to compact it and to cement or to to, 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 to com to, to, to condition it, to immobilize it in a cementitious matrix, or maybe to melt it in, in, in a melter and to produce some um, uh, glass-like um, material out of it. Anyway, it's non burnable material. Anyway, we significantly reduce the volume. And the reduction of the volume is uh, between 50 to 100 for solid radioactive waste. And for liquid, we are burning liquid, and the, the, the ash residue here is, is extremely small in volume, so can be even up to 1,000. Uh, a, a reported volume, if you incinerate some, some liquids, it's, it's a very small residues in form of the ash. Uh, I put here a photograph. The photograph is taken from Vienna, Vienna, the, war, the, the, the place where I worked for, for, for eight years, and I in Vienna. And it looks like an art object, right? So this is an incinerator. Not of radioactive waste, no. It is to incinerate. It is in the city of Vienna. And it, it, it was a very unpopular place in Vienna until the Viennese, the government of, of Vienna, they invited a, a very famous, a very famous artist with the name Hundert Wasser. And he said, I will do the business. Don't worry. This place will be very popular for you. So incinerator was very good. Gas purification, very good. No smell, nothing. But it's is burning trash in the city. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. It's incinerating the trash, that you know, the garbage. What, what this has to do in the city? And Hundert Wasser produced a design, and nowadays it's a monument of art. There are rock concerts held there. You see here, this is the uh, 
uh, uh, stuck where the off-gases are pumped out of the incinerator. But it's in a form, you see, uh, of a monument. So the people, the tourists are, are visiting this place to see the art made by, by the Hunda Pasa. But it's not for radio here, once again. So it's a popular place in Vienna uh, because it's a monument of art, but in reality is burning trash. Municipal waste. Municipal, municipal waste. As for the radioactive waste, Austria is operating an incinerator which is about 40 kilometers from Vienna. It's a small city with the name Sleipersdorf. And in this city, this is a schematic of incinerator of radioactive waste of Austria. In the past, Austria wanted to build a nuclear power plant, but, but because of the, 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 you know, these things that happened, because of the Chernobyl, of course, they decided no, no. So uh, the, 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 the nuclear power plants are everywhere around Austria, except Austria. So, uh, but, you know, it's democracy. Okay, so um, uh, the incineration, it is used in many, many, many countries, Canada, France, Germany, Slovakia, Sweden, United Kingdom, United States, they all, these are schemes, Belgium, these are technological schemes from these countries. So typically, for incineration, we use temperature around 900 degrees. Uh, typical the consumption of the fuel is given here, so 0.25 kilogram of the fuel per kilogram of the waste, because we need, you know, it's wet. Not, it's, not everything is burnable, right? Um, and um, uh, incineration typically if you look at the technological scheme, maybe Volcano will give you this information again. Typically we have one chamber which is combustion chamber, and then the second one which is called post-combustion chamber. So here we have some fire grates. Here it's, it's, it's the pile of the waste. Uh, so here we are pumping the, the, the oxygen the, together with the air typically. So they are the bags, they are burning here and all gases are then additionally, additionally burned in the post combustion chamber. Um, plasmatrons can be used both here and here in order to, 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 to do the process more effectively. And in, incinera oops, in incineration, we are using the rule of 3T. 3T. So that's, I don't know about Volcano, will give you that or not, it's from my book. So we need temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the capacity. We need time. If it is not enough time, then, then not everything will be burned. And we need turbulence in, in the gaseous space in order to have a good mixing. If you have this 3 rule, then everything is born very well. Uh, so if you look schematically, we need to recognize the volume reduction factor, which is the volume of the waste to the volume of the ash. And we obtain after incineration gas, which should be purified, condensate some liquids, some soot, and some ash. This part, so this is discharged into atmosphere after purification. This is needs to be treatment and condition if it is not advanced incineration. So after incineration, we have off gas, ash residue, soot, and condensate according to this picture, just shown. Typical distribution of radionuclides among these products is in the ash, we have almost everything. So 90, 95% typically of the radioactivity is in the ash. So the initial volume of the waste was large. The final volume is small, but the radioactivity is almost there in the small. So specific radioactivity is increased, pay attention. Maybe classification will be even different after incineration. In the suit, one to five percent, in the condensate, 0.1 to percent. Incinerations are all incineration are characterized by the so called waste acceptance criteria. Not all kinds of the burnable waste can be accepted for incineration. So typical, typical limitations. Mr. Polkanov will give you the data for his incinerator, which is operating in, in, in Sergio Passar, not far from, from Moscow, some, 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 some 75 kilometers, something like that. But typically, the, the, the limitations are on beta activity this and on alpha activity this. These limitations are because the off-gas purification system will not be able to cope with the very high content of, of radionuclides in both places. And let's say in, in, in Balduc in France, there is a specific incinerator which has 
limitations one order of magnitude higher than these. But off gas purification system is much more complex and we imagine it's much more expensive, right? So these are typical limitations, not exact. In the specification, in the waste acceptance criteria of each incinerator facility, these limitations are explicit shown. Not everything can be accepted. And of course, there are limitations on the chemical composition. Not all kinds of plastic materials are accepted, the content is limited, and so on and so on. And because of that, we are moving to the next advanced incinerators. So uh, I think that th th this topic will be well covered by Mr. Polkanov. So I will go quite quickly here. So, um, so um, it's, uh, it's, um, um, these are incinerators that operate uh, using plasma torch, which allow to treat uh, universally all kinds of the waste, including non-burnable materials. So it's accepting almost everything, but also there are some waste acceptance criteria. So it's, it's, it's again, not everything is accepted, even in advanced incinerators. So um, um, uh, this is definitely to be shown by Mr. Polkanov. So um, in, in, in this type of incinerators, we have in the lower part of incinerator um, plasma, plasma torches, which generate here an extremely high temperature. And this temperature gradually decreases up to the loading part where we put the packages. So in such a way, in, in, in one facility, in one device, we have several processing zones. So the package which enter the incinerator here, it's warm. Some of the water starts to evaporate. Then it is fully evaporated. Then we have some decomposition. Then moving down to the high temperature, we have the oxidation, so burning of burnable materials. And when the material, the ash, which is produced here in this part comes to the very lower part, it is even fully melted because the temperature becomes so high that even, even, even refractory materials start to melt, start to melt. And an important point is that here we have a very high carryover, volatilization of radionuclides. But these radionuclides here, when they, 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 they try this together with the gases to, to get out of, of the device, because the air is pumped into this direction, they are condensed back. So because of that, the carryover is really small. So this is uh, a, a schematic of this shaft furnace used uh, in facility Radon, not far from Moscow. And this facility, this type of facility is used even internationally. Um, and this is uh, the, the container with the material which is produced after, after uh, application of this technology. So uh, that's, that's again schematic of this facility. Volcano will explain it more. And this is uh, taken from a paper published by my, my colleagues from, from, from uh, Radon about two facilities. One had the name Pyrolysis and another current operating proton or it. It was operating in, in, in Radon. The capacity was 200 to 150 kilograms per hour. You see, it's a huge facility, so the, the dimensions are in meters here. And um, it's, it's uh, using um, plasmatrons are plasma torches, very powerful, more than 100 kilowatts. The, the power of, of, of these um, um, plasma torches. And um, uh, uh, there is some carryover of, of uh, volatile radionuclides. And here it's also the, the consumption of, of, of the power. Um, so um, with that, I am finishing uh, because I, I believe that uh, Mr. Poltano will give you much more information about, about that. So I'm moving to the treatment of liquids very quickly. I, I explained it all practically my, my, my information here. So let, let, me, let me go very quickly indeed. So for the liquids, we again have the schematic, the water, uh, contaminated water is purified. So we have the purified stream and the sludge obtained. And the contamination factor is defined as the, the, the initial radioactivity to, to divide it to the, the remnant radioactivity in the purified water. Uh, again, in, 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 uh, there is a schematic how to, to select. There is a IE uh, recommendation how to select a treatment method, and there are four four basic uh, methods used in the treatment of, uh, of uh, liquid radioactive waste, so chemical precipitation, uh, ion exchange, evaporation, and membra membrane methods. So first of all, before the real treatment, we need a treatment. We need to sediment large parts in the liquid waste. 
we need to, to, to adjust maybe the, the pH of, of the material before passing it through the real treatment process. So because of that, some, some filters are used, like schematic of this cartridge filter used. And there is a table which characterizes genetically three main methods of purification of liquid radioactive waste. So the, 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 the precipitation, it's uh, the, the, the one which is largely used when we add some chemical additives into the liquid, into the water, which is contaminated. We cause precipitation of uh, pr production of some flocculs, which start to settle down. And these flocculs capture the radiant part. So schematic, it is shown here. So the stage one, we add some chemicals, typically hydroxides. They first are mixed well, then they start to produce flocculs. These flocculs settle down, and then we will just separate this layer from this layer, and this is the purification. That's all. That's it. And uh, here are the, the, the radionuclides typical, the precipitants. You see hydroxides are typically used, the pH. And the contamination factor, which can be very high, you see, higher than 1,000, higher than 100, and so on. Um, can be facilities small size, large size, is the higher capacity. The next method is ion exchange. So we have some materials which are impregnated, let's say here, it's sodium. Uh, and after ion exchange, it will be exchanged by calcium. And in the initial water, which is calcium, can be analog strontium will be fixed on the ion exchanger. And here we will have the water, which the, 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 the radio the nuclides can be here. They are non-radioactive, are released into the water. So all the radioactivity, strontium, let's say, it is kept here. So again, there are uh, different type of the processes. Uh, we need to, to properly select the exchanger sorbents. There are many developments in this area, many works done. There are criteria used in selection of these sorbents. So I move to the, the next method, very universal one, very powerful, evaporation. It's, it's quite universal. And apart from, let's say, tritium, some volatiles like iodine, it works perfectly in the very, very high capacity. So we just distillate water. We just distillate water. So this is the, the, the information about this distillator. And look here, the decontamination factors are are, you see, up to a million times. So evaporated water is practically clean. It's a very powerful method. And the last method is membrane method. When we apply pressure or maybe electrical current on something to membrane, and the membrane has, has such small pores that retains the radiant class. And because of that can be different uh, membranes. Microfiltration, it retains in relatively large particles. Ultrafiltration, 5 to 50 nanometers. Nanofiltration, half of nanometer up to 5 nanometer. And the, the most uh, perfect, fine membranes, they retain practically even molecules. So a fraction of nanometer up to 1 nanometer. And we can apply, for example, here pressure on contaminated water. And this water will pass through and it will be purified. Here is the information about these methods here in this part, and these all kind, you see, reverse osmosis, it is used like distillation to retain even ions. Uh, uh, the information about all kinds of these membranes, uh, tables with this information, characterization of this method, information about reverse osmosis, and the final slide about cost. You see here, if you look here, so um, distillation, you need to evaporate water. So it doesn't matter the content of radiant lights in the water. We need any way to evaporate. So the, the, because of that, the, the, the price is the same. But other methods, it depends. So um, that gives you a kind of, uh, depending on the content of, of, of uh, concentration of salts, all kind of the method is more effectively to be used. So uh, I, I, can, I, I come here to the conclusion. Sorry that, that, that uh, I, I left uh, for, for the questions just one, two minutes, not more. So these are the, the, the obvious uh, conclusions about the treatment of liquids and solids. And the generic reference, it's a monograph, which in the United Kingdom it's, uh, it is used by universities for, for, for the students that uh, take the courses on uh, nuclear waste management uh, or generic use of nuclear industry. It's available only in English. Um, currently, we are uh, negotiating with China to translate it into Chinese. 
So, uh, but at the moment, it's just in English. Uh, there is no um, uh, Russian variant of this. Uh, so, dear uh, uh, yeah, participants, I, I, I stop sharing uh, uh, the screen. And um, if you have, you don't have, but if you want, <laughs> you can ask something. I will, I'll, tomorrow you, you'll see me again in the morning. Maybe we will discuss tomorrow maybe other questions together with mine. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, colleagues, any questions? Not yet? Oh, yeah, okay. Then see you tomorrow. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, please. Just one question. Okay. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, I have uh, two questions about the first uh, presentation. Uh, the first one, about uh, radiation uh, waste uh, disposal. Uh, this uh, method is uh, the final step to uh, get uh, about uh, uh, radiation waste management. So when we uh, put the uh, radiation uh, waste inside the earth uh, when the pure it, uh, how can we know if the uh, we know if this uh, uh, radiation or the waste uh, can reaction with the, the material? For example, the shielding, which shielding uh, can use, is is it there is any uh, reactions uh, between the radiation and this uh, material for covered or shielding this uh, sources of this uh, waste? It's the first question. Okay. You, uh, you you want to answer now and or you put the question two questions together i i can start answering then and then you'll you you you'll ask me the second okay okay so so dear colleagues yes this is a, this is a, a topic of investigation where a lot of science is done so the radiation has a very strong uh, particularly for high level waste where, where the intensity of radiation is very high so the, the materials under irradiation are changing so uh, the, 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 there are many processes which occur due to effect of radiation on materials. And uh, these effects occur mainly, mainly uh, with the material which immobilize the wear, where the, the, the intensity of radiation is higher. So the waste forms which immobilize the waste, they are the first materials to be subject to continuous irradiation during all time of their being there. So hundreds of years, thousands of years, they are bombarded by radiation. Yes. And the scientists everywhere investigate the changes that occur. And we have a lot of information about the behavior of the cements, glasses, bitumens, all kinds of the materials. And uh, even the rocks, even the rocks are subject to radiation. Also, if you are far from the base package, you imagine that the radiation are shielded and the effect of radiation is much smaller. Nevertheless, near, near the buffer material, which is near the package, is also affected by irradiation. So this is a large topic of investigations. Some of, of this information will be given in other lectures, but this topic is, to answer to your questions, is under attention and the information that is currently accumulated is fully accounted in a such a way that with a very high degree of confidence, we understand the consequences of these effects and uh, we, 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 we are sure that the, 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 valid, the models that we are applying in predictions, because we, we, we have no possibility to, to wait for these millions of years to see what will happen in reality. But with the very high degree of confidence, we, we, we are sure that, that the behavior will be such that uh, no harm will, the waste will produce to the, to, to the environment. And in, in this area, the, the, that is why also we rely on geological formation. Because if you will miss something, nevertheless, the geological formation will protect us against of any effect of radiation from that. that. That's brief answer, very concise answer to, to your question. Yes, uh, also something about this question. Uh, if uh, we get uh, some uh, leaks in this, uh, in this cover or shielding, uh, how can uh, protect or treatment this uh, case when the distribution 
distribution for uh, the waste uh, out the shielding in the earth or something about in the deep. How can we, uh, what we do about this case if this, uh, there is any distribution or uh, leaks in this uh, cover or this shielding? Uh, the, 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 the waste packages are manufactured in such a way that such type of processes uh, it cannot occur even, even theoretically. So uh, the, the, the release of uh, components of the waste, the release of uh, radioactive components, the release of any other components of the waste uh, can occur only gradually. Tomorrow in my lecture, I will show you exactly so uh, the, 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 how uh, it, it occur the release of the components of the waste and uh, you will have uh, the, the, the information about the minuscule uh, effect of these releases because uh, the, the, the parameters that, that characterize them. So they have requirements. They have requirements everywhere in any country on the uh, immobilizing materials. And these requirements are such that this release, that is why, by the way, liquid radioactive waste are not allowed uh, to be disposed of. Because then the materials, the water, it's immediately in contact with the geological formation. And um, uh, the, the, the materials that currently are used, cements, glasses, other materials, ceramics, they, the release of, uh, of components from these materials are, are such small that we, 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 and we see we have natural analogs. So for example, we, we see glasses with, with the age of millions and millions of years, and these glasses have the uranium there still. Yes, <laughs> so uh, things that you ask about, they, they, they cannot occur even theoretically. So, uh, so uh, they, uh, they, they, they may occur, uh, you know, because of, of uh, some accidents, some, uh, some catastrophes. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe, maybe uh, fire will occur in a disposal facility during its operation. Because of that, we need to be very full during operation of these facilities. Yes, the, uh, next uh, question. Uh, also about uh, the first uh, presentation, this one about uh, the work uh, who work in the radiation or uh, uh, for uh, uh, public uh, people when uh, get uh, exposure by radio and light. This mean uh, uh, by inhale inhalation or ingestion when uh, into the body for human body or any uh, animal or some, something about that, but the important of uh, human body when in inhalation or ingestion inside the body, how can we remove or reduce uh, this uh, radionuclide inside the body? Or uh, okay, so any procedure you, can yeah, yeah, uh, follow you. this? You know, the, the, the question is it's, uh, definitely out of the scope of, uh, of the talk. Look, nuclear industry is highly regulated. So um, the things that you just noted that, that belong to, 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 to maybe some catastrophe when, you know, like, like in, in Goiania in Brazil happened, in Chernobyl happened, indeed. So this is uh, um, radiobiology and the, the, the medical uh, experts in, in this area, they know what, what kind of the treatment should, should uh, be subject to the patient in this case. Um, and, and to remove the radionuclides, and uh, there are so-called biological half-lives. So the radionuclides cannot stay uh, forever in, in our bodies. There is, there is a known uh, in medicine, this is a known. It's another half-life, not of the decay, is the removal half-life. And unfortunately, some of the radionuclides, they like our body. So let's say strontium-90, it likes the bones. It doesn't want to go <laughs> quickly out, so, and so on. So this is not my topic. Uh, so I'm sorry. Um, um, uh, that these are things that, um, if, you, you, you know, if you want a dedicated answer, it, it goes out of, uh, of uh, things that I'm dealing with. Uh, and once again, don't forget that the nuclear industry, um, it's highly regulated and um, you cannot uh, start working with the radioactive materials with the license. If you have some practices in, in, in Moscow uh, State University, uh, you know, be sure that uh, <laughs> They, 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 the only dedicated experts that, that have obtained license to operate with the sorted amounts, with the high degree of safety and so on and so on, 
And I, I worked 20 years in a nuclear waste management organization. Even I, I'm doctor of science and professor and so on and so on. Every year, I pass the examination for radiological protection because that, that is the regulation. I am sorry, I, I know history was from Italy, the, the, the professor like me, he couldn't pass, you know, that because he forgot, the, the, you know, the, the, the safe level of something. And then these are high anecdotes, but they happen. So, you know, if, if you work in, in, in a nuclear, that it's highly regulated, very restricted and so on. So, uh, but uh, accidents happen everywhere. And, uh, and uh, then, then the, the dedicated expert will deal with the people who got something more than, than the law in the, in the body. And they know how to do that, not me. Thank you so much for having fit for your answer. Uh, thank you very much. And we have two questions uh, from online participants. So uh, where we can find the handbook uh, to uh, that one? I see. Uh, 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 so uh, handbook. Uh, <laughs> which which one? <laughs> you know, I have I have to give you two answers, but they are recorded. So, <laughs> so what to do? I will be guilty anyway. So the, the first answer, you need to purchase this book from the publisher because it's not open access. The handbook, if you ask me about the handbook. So this is the official answer. But I am aware about non-official. So you know the the, the, the hackers. The, the, the experts in computer science who know how to do it. So they somehow downloaded it. So you, you can find a book which was stolen from the publisher. <laughs> and then non-officially breaching the laws, you can download it from there. But uh, yeah, this is prohibited to do. But, uh, you know, you can do that <laughs> privately <laughs> and not uh, quoting me that I informed you about. Sorry. But the IAEA publications, all of them, they are freely accessible to download. Absolutely, all, all the books. So it, it, it's, it's that. But you asked me about the handbook. So that is information that I am aware of. Thank you. And the last one, what final disposal is given to treat waste? Uh, to treat it waste. So uh, uh, we will speak tomorrow about the conditioning. So treated waste, very rarely, it is allowed for disposal. Only advanced incinerators produce very good waste for, which goes you know, for transportation and disposal because the quality of the material is very good. Otherwise, after treatment, you, you got conditioning, conditioning. So let's speak about conditioning tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some more questions? No, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. See, see you tomorrow. tomorrow. See you. Bye bye.
Андрей, ты меня слышишь? Я вас не слышу. And now, are you yes. here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, who will show the screen? You or we? I, I, I. just moon. You, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay. So can you see my screen? <clears throat> yeah, but not in the full screen. Yeah, just a moment. Mm -hmm. Bit so long. <laughs> Yeah, perfectly. So uh, just uh, three minutes. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, dear colleagues, please take your seats. Let's start our next lecture from Dr. Vladimir Petrov. Dear yeah. Vladimir, floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Andrei. Hello, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not with you in Moscow, but I'm in Tomsk, in Siberia. Very nice city, and I'm here. And business trip sorry for that but uh i will be able to make these presentations online that is good so uh let's start with the destructive characterization of radioactive waste but first uh, i would like to start with a short question or comment uh, when we analyze uh, the radioactive waste uh, what we uh, really want to know about the radioactive waste and and um, uh, how we can do it so uh first of all of course we would like to know the content of radiant collides to sort to classify the radioactive waste and content of radiant light means that uh, we should know the amount and type of the radiant collides uh, there are also another char characteristics of uh, radioactive waste like dose rate 
uh, because it's safety for personnel and also the chemical properties, how to store or dispose this uh, radioactive waste properly. And the chemical properties, it's not only the aggregate state lights, is it solid or liquid, but it also uh, the properties like corrosion pro properties or um, uh, expo explosive pro properties and some others. But today uh, we will speak uh, about uh, the content of uh, retinoclides and uh, I briefly would like to start with uh, the basic information on the detection of the uh, retinoclides. So uh, yesterday it was a lecture uh, about the gamma spectrometry, but in principle, how we can detect uh, the uh, radiation from the radioactive materials. And uh, the only way uh, to detect, to analyze any uh, retinoclides is to measure uh, how the ionizing radiation that emits uh, that is emitted by radionuclide how this ionizing radiation interacts with matter so only uh, this is uh, the way uh, of detection so we cannot see uh, ionizing radiation or feel it or whatever we uh, all the detections uh, they are based on interaction of ionizing radiation with matter and uh, the mechanisms of this uh, interaction, uh, they can be different. Uh, main of them uh, are ionization and uh, excitation. In case of ionization, uh, we measure the electric current uh, that produces in the material of detector. And in this case, we call uh, the detectors ionization detectors. It, it is, uh, can be uh, semiconductor detection uh, detectors or it can be uh, gas field cameras. Uh, uh, so it's even if uh, the materials are very diff different in, in the first case, when it is uh, gas field chambers, uh, we're talking about the uh, gaseous material as a main part of detector. Uh, but in semiconductor uh, detectors, uh, it is solid, so quite uh, different, but the mechanisms are the same. It is ionization and the production of electric current. Uh, and other detectors uh, are scintillation detectors, and uh, we measure the visible light uh, that is produced as a, uh, as a result of the interaction of ionizing uh, radiation with matter. In this case, the scintillation detectors can be either organic, uh, like uh, plastic scintillators or liquid uh, scintillators, or they can be uh, inorganic, like crystals, like uh, sodium iodide, uh, cesium iodide, uh, lantanum bromide, and uh, others. Uh, other mechanisms of uh, um, interaction of ionizing radiation is production of defects, and in this case we just analyze the number and the shape of defects, and uh, we use for this uh, track detectors, either alpha track detectors, or uh, it can be uh, track detectors for uh, fissile materials, and some others uh, we will see it later. And uh, it can be energy absorption. So we uh, analyze the heat uh, that is produced in the materials. And in this case, we call them calorimetric uh, detectors. And usually they are used for uh, the uh, So, so many different detectors. So what are the main characteristics of any uh, detectors? Uh, I would say there are two main characteristics. It, it is efficiency of the detector. So um, how efficient uh, the detector to detect uh, the uh, ionizing radiation that already uh, penetrate uh, the materials. For example, if uh, 100 uh, gamma quanta uh, come to uh, the detector, it doesn't mean that uh, all of this uh, 100 uh, gamma quanta will be detected. For example, if it will be 31 uh, gamma quanta that will be detected, that means that the efficiency is 31%. So uh, it is very important parameter because uh, the high efficiency, um, uh, the uh, low activity we can measure, and uh, uh, the more the lower uh, uncertainty will be in our uh, measurement. 
So in in this uh, equation, uh, I put it here. Uh, here, this uh, I C it, it is the counting rate uh, of this uh, of our sample. So that means uh, that um, uh, it is how many uh, pulses or counts uh, we uh, measure. So it, it is the response of our detector of our system. Uh, B here is uh, the background of the detector or the system. And of course, when we measure sample, we all also measure background and we always should remember about it. Uh, here A is the absolute efficiency that we would like uh, to measure, to uh, not to measure, but to determine. And um, so, uh, fee uh it is efficiency efficiency as i already mentioned and p is just a property of the radionuclide itself uh this number indicates uh, a fraction of quantum or particles alpha beta beta plus or beta minus particles uh, that are released per every decay uh, of the radionuclide so it can be from very low numbers uh, like uh, i don't know 1000 part or it can be up to uh, one one so it's uh 100 uh, percent for some gamma lines it can be even more so it can be more than 100 percent but uh, it's uh, a bit another story so uh, uh to determine the activity of course we should know all these uh, other parameters like background of our system and uh, properties of the radionuclide and of course we should know efficiency another important characteristics of uh, uh, detectors is the resolution so in principle resolution is the ability to distinguish between two events uh, so it it can be uh time resolution or it can be special uh, resolution or it can be energetical resolution or any other uh, resolution if um, you need them so uh, that means that uh, we can dist distinguish between uh, two uh, two counts for example if we are talking about the uh, time resolution uh, the higher the resolution is uh, the better for example if we have very bad time resolution for example uh, our detectors can detect two uh, two events uh, only after one millisecond that means that if uh, uh, one event is already detected uh, for example, I don't know, alpha particle is uh, uh, coming to the detector and we detect it. And only after one millisecond, uh, uh, we can detect the next alpha particle. If any uh, alpha particle come uh, to the detector in this interval, so from zero to one millisecond, it will be not detected. So uh, we will miss uh, the alpha particle and thus uh, we will measure the lower activity than uh, it is in reality. So the uh, time resolution is uh, very important. Also the energy resolution, if we have a very complex mix mixture of radiant glides, uh, we have to have a very good energy resolution to distinguish between uh, two uh, peaks with the very close energies for example or if we are uh, trying to find uh, some particles or radionuclides uh, in our sample we try to figure out where it is located when we need to uh, have a good uh, special uh, resolution so two main characteristics uh, are efficiency and uh, resolution so, and uh, how we can detect uh, ionizing radiation, I will just uh, briefly mention about uh, three, four methods. Uh, first uh, will be latent scintillation counting. Uh, so it is uh, used for uh, Hey, colleagues, uh, can you switch off your mic? Just a moment. Yeah, okay, I, I switch it off. <laughs> so, uh, 
this is the use of uh, liquid uh, scintillators. So it is a mixture or cocktail of the um, scintillating molecules uh, with the some solvent. And uh, it is not a big fraction of the scintillating molecules, just uh, two, three percent of these uh, molecules. But uh, what they can do uh, when we have uh, this liquid mixture and we put our ready nuclide in this mixture, it can be either beta emitters or alpha emitters. And then as far as we have uh, much more solvent molecules, these solvent molecules interact with the emitted beta particles, for example, and uh, solvent molecules, uh, let's say, accumulate energy from the beta particles. And then the solvent molecules can transfer accumulated energy to the scintillating molecules. And what is doing scintillating molecules? They produce light. Yeah? And we detect the light, just the visible light, with the photomultiplier tube. So uh, this device can convert the light uh, from the scintillator to the electric current. So uh, finally, we just uh, measure the electric current and uh, uh, we can see how much uh, activity was uh, in the sample. And we also uh, can have not only the number of counts, but also the energy of these counts uh, that means that uh, we can have a spectrum um, and we can distinguish between different reading plots with this spectrum. It is very difficult when uh, beta particles have very similar energies than these uh, two peaks. When we have low, um, um, low energy resolution, uh, we, will, we will have not two separated peaks but we will have only one yeah so it's uh, it will be not very convenient uh so uh, liquid scintillation counting is very efficient efficient again means that all the most let's say close to 100 percent of all the alpha and beta particles that are emitted will be detected uh, with the liquid scintillation technique uh, yeah, uh, in principle, it can be uh, uh, we can use uh, different vials. Uh, it is either plastic vial, as uh, in the middle uh, of this picture, or it can be glass vial. Uh, they can be with different uh, uh, volume. Uh, these are 20 milliliter uh, uh, vials, they can be seven milliliters or even smaller, uh, depends on what you are measuring and if you have the special cassettes for, for, for these uh, other vials. Um, uh, you saw this uh, uh, spectra from tritium, carbon-14, and uh, phosphorus-32 here, and uh, all these uh, beta spectras, they look uh, really similar. They, of course, uh, shifted uh, uh, by the energy scale, but their shape is more or less uh, the same. Uh, but if we will look on alpha spectra, we will see uh, these uh, sharp peaks, and uh, they are quite different from the peaks uh, from the beta em emitting uh, radionuclides. There are also other sharp peaks produced by the energy consumption from the conversion electrons. The conversion electrons, they have as alpha particles also um, um, certain energy, so certain energy levels and certain energy of electrons. That's why the peaks uh, of conversion electrons looks very sharp, like alpha um, uh, lines or like uh, gamma uh, lines as uh, you saw yesterday. Uh, you can use also different uh, representation of your spectrum. In this uh, slide, on the left and on the right side, it is the same spectra, but uh, on the uh, left side, the energy scale is in uh, linear mode. So uh, every um, uh, this scale divided 
just linearly by, I don't know, 100 or 500 uh, kilo electron volts. But on the right side, this energy scale is in logarithmic uh, scale. So uh, it, it is, again, the same scale, but uh, just represented in different forms. And you can, in logarithmic uh, scale, you can uh, see more clear uh, different peaks uh, from different uh, radio lights. Uh, the, one of the drawback of the liquid scintillation counting, except the preparation of the sample itself, uh, is the uh, possibility of quenching of our spectrum. What means quenching? If we have a chemical quench, so in principle, quenching is the uh, uh, when we lose some photons, and uh, thus uh, we can say that we measure uh, less photons uh, when we uh, should measure from our sample. What uh, does it mean for the spectrum? So uh, the number of photons for uh, photomultiplier tubes means uh, the initial energy that come to the system. So the more photons come to the uh, photomultiplier tube, the higher energy uh, was uh, at the initial beta particle or alpha particle. So if we lose uh, photons, that means for the detector uh, that we uh, have the lower energy of the particles. And that means that the spectra, spect spectrum shifted uh, to the lower energies. So we have this shift of the spec spectrum uh, to the uh, lower energy scale. Uh, it is uh, one consequence. Another consequence that if um, there is intensive quenching, uh, maybe uh, none of the photons will come to the detector. That means that we will miss our particle. We will uh, count less particles as it was uh, released. So that means that we will uh, have not only the shift of spectrum, but also uh, we will obtain the smaller area of our peak. And that means the uh, lower counting rate. And maybe if we uh, didn't uh, understand the quenching, uh, we will measure the lower activity than it is in reality. So uh, quenching can be uh, of two natures. Either it is chemical quench when we have in our uh, mixture of uh, some organic or inorganic molecule that can uh, that can take this energy from the solvent molecules. So in principle, this energy from solvent molecules should go to the scintillator molecules, but uh, this uh, chemical uh, quenching agents can take this energy and so no scintillator will be uh, excited and uh, release the photons. So we will lose this energy and no photons. Uh, another option is the color quench. So when uh, the scintillator molecule released the light, but this photon is absorbed by some color agent. And thus, this uh, photon uh, didn't come to the uh, detector. Again, we lose um, our photon. So either chemical or color, color quench uh, should be uh, taken into, in, into account. And uh, there are systems. I, I will not uh, go uh, in detail of this system, but uh, we can obtain, let's call it some quench, parameter, in this case it is uh, this year, uh, parameters from the Perkin-Elmer um, machine. And we can say that uh, we can build the dependence of efficiency of detection of our radionuclides depending on the quench parameter. And thus, when we will measure our sample, if we know the quench parameter, we can calculate the efficiency of detection of our system. It is very important for uh, beta emitting radionuclides with low uh, energy of beta particles like tritium or carbon-14 or I don't know, nickel-63 or some others. 
But for alpha particles, it is not so important. You can see that even for very low quench parameters, the efficiency of detection of alpha particles emitted from the plutonium to 39 is very high. It's very close to 100%. So in, in principle, liquid scintillation counting is very efficient. But for this, uh, to use this, uh, we need to separate our uh, red nuclei. Uh, there is also a possibility to distinguish between alpha and beta uh, emitters, not only by the shape of the spectrum, but also uh, by the analysis of the pulse, electric pulse uh, uh, that is generated uh, by uh, the light that is emitting uh, <laughs> as a result of action of alpha or beta particle. And you see that in case of uh, alpha particle, uh, the pulse uh, lasts longer. So uh, we can uh, say, for example, that uh, till this time uh, here, uh, it is pulse uh, from both alpha and beta particles, but all the uh, rest of the pulse is related only to the alpha particle. So if uh, you have this uh, discriminator by time or by the shape of the pulse, you can uh, separate the alpha spectrum, the alpha particles, counts by alpha particles, from the whole spectrum. So you can finally obtain alpha spectrum and beta spectrum, as it was um, earlier shown in uh, this uh, slide here. Uh, the top right picture, you can see the uh, green line. It is the extracted alpha spectrum. Uh, from the liquid scintillation uh, counter, uh, Quantulus. And uh, you can see the uh, red spectra. It is beta spectra. So in principle, it, in, in initially, it was uh, uh, one sample uh, contain, uh, that, that contained both alpha and beta emitters. But with the use of this alpha-beta discriminator, we can obtain separated alpha and beta spectra. So it, it is very uh, convenient uh, to use to analyze uh, a mixture of alpha and beta particles if you have them in your sample. Another advantage of the uh, scintillating uh, technique is uh, the measure, measuring of the uh, Cherenkov uh, radiation. So Cherenkov radiation uh, is produced uh, in uh, any dielectric materials, solid dielectric or liquid dielectric materials, uh, when the particles are moving faster uh, than the light in this material. So we know that uh, there is a limit of the velocity. So the uh, speed of light is the maximum uh, speed that can be um, that can have that can be uh, realized, but in vacuum. But when we are talking about the media, like solid materials or liquid materials or gaseous materials, the speed of light is not uh, anymore uh, a limit. So and particles uh, can go faster. And uh, for beta particles, uh, this uh, limit or equivalent of speed of light is uh, around 260 kilo electron volts. So and many uh, radio, beta emitting radio nuclides uh, have beta particles with higher energy. So these uh, beta particles that move faster uh, than light in the media, then they produce light. So uh, more correctly to say that uh, media produces light, so because uh, this light is emitted by media, uh, but to, to understand it more Easy, we can say that the particles uh, uh, emits uh, particle emits light. Uh, so again, for water, for example, uh, again for water, beta particles should move faster uh, than two hundred sixty kilo electron volts. And there is a, a short list of some radionuclides uh, that have beta particles with maximum energy much more than this 260 kiloelectron volts. 
you can see this pair of strontium and yttrium 90 and we can measure strontium 19 uh, by the cheering of counting of yttrium 19 there is a quite high efficiency and what is more important or maybe not more but uh, that is important that uh for cheering of counting we don't need to use any organic uh, scintillator molecules or any solvents we use just water and water produces light uh, when this uh, fast moving um, beta particles interacts with water and we measure uh, this light cheering of light um, emitted from water and we can say how much strontium we have in our sample so quite uh, good technique but again for this uh, we should have very good um, separation of our uh, radio light uh, there is uh, uh, different possibilities uh, how to organize uh, the uh, detection of the counts from the photomultiplier tubes to decrease the background and uh, one of uh, this approach is to use the coincidence scheme for example that means that the signal that comes only from one photomultiplier tube will not uh, be count because uh, it, it, it is just a background signal from the photomultiplier tube but if the signal comes uh, simultaneously from two multi photomultiplier tubes that means that uh, this signal is caused uh, by the uh, interaction of ionizing radiation with our scintillator uh, that emits light and this light reaches uh, two photomultiplier tubes uh, simultaneously thus it is a useful signal and we should count it uh, other signals that comes only from one photomultiplier tubes will not be counted so thus we decrease the uh, background there are some examples of the liquid scintillating count counters uh, from perkin elmer or hydex uh, nowadays quantulus is also perkin elmer so uh, they are main uh, producers of these uh, techniques uh, another method for measuring alpha emitting uh, radio lights is alpha spectrometry with the use of semiconductor detectors. Uh, uh, the easiest, well, not, uh, not the, easiest, the simplest material for this is uh, just a silicon, good silicon. Uh, no uh, pure germanium is needed for, uh, for alpha spectrometry, but what is needed is a, a vacuum chamber because uh, if you as you remember uh, alpha particles they have very short range uh, even in air if uh, in in our camera will be air uh, then not all the alpha particles uh, will reach the detector so we will uh, decrease the efficiency of uh, our detection system thus uh, to reach uh, higher uh, efficiency uh, we can use uh, the vacuum chambers and uh, more alpha particles will uh, come uh, to the uh, detector you can see from this uh, tom, uh, not tom, bottom right uh, picture uh, that if we increase uh, the pressure of air in the vacuum chamber uh, just from 20 millibar to 100 millibar uh, the shape and uh, the number of counts uh, decreases significant, significantly but uh, we can use it intentionally to decrease uh, the number of uh, alpha particles or uh, not alpha particles but uh, the recoil nucleus that can reach uh, the detectors so uh, when we have alpha decay we have not only alpha particles but we also have a recoil uh, nuclei uh, and uh, this recoil uh, uh, nuclei they have quite a high energy uh, something around 100 200 uh, kilo electron uh, volts and uh, this energy is enough uh, for them to reach uh, the detector and if such uh, uh, detectors uh, will uh, reach uh, the detectors they will stay in this de detector and they will um, uh, just not destroy but uh, the characteristics of the detector uh, will be uh, worse uh, in principle if we prepare good 
counting sample, a good uh, source of for counting, we will have such a good uh, alpha spectra with high energy resolution, and we can distinguish between different uh, radio nuclei. But if we prepare a bad source for counting, we will have this uh, sample effect. Uh, that means that we will have not these sharp peaks, uh, but the peaks with the long uh, tails. And um, it is not uh, good for um, separation of uh, different uh, radiant lights for um, the determination of their activity. Uh, to prepare a good counting source, we can use um, either electro deposition on uh, stainless steel or nickel disks or, or other uh, metal disks. Uh, uh, in this, on this uh, metal disk, we will uh, get a very fine uh, layer or we can use that is now much uh, simpler maybe more costly but much simpler uh, is the use of um, uh, the special uh, filters uh, with the cerium fluoride or barium sul uh, sulfate and uh, when we fil filtrate or precipitate precipitate our uh, radionuclide on this uh, we will get also very fine uh, layer of uh, uh, precipitate on these disks, and then we will measure our uh, spectra. For, there's a comparison between the uh, semiconductor detector, uh, silicon uh, semiconductor detector, when we measure alpha particles from a radium source. And you can see many, many uh, peaks that we can. Uh, uh, detect many uh, radium nuclides in this sample. But if we will use uh, liquid insulation uh, counting, of course, we will see some peaks, but uh, we cannot say uh, precisely uh, what is this peak because there is a mixture of uh, radium nuclide. So, just example how the energy resolution is important uh, when you measure a mixture of uh, radium nuclides. Uh, and yeah, again, some examples of the um, uh, techniques uh, for measuring the alpha spectrum. Another technique uh, is the track analysis. It can be either alpha track analysis or track analysis of uh, fissile materials after neutron radiation. Uh, and on the left side, you can see the example of the plastic uh, detector. So it's alpha track uh, detector. Uh, These dots, it is uh, tracks or let's say defects uh, in the plastic that are caused by the action of alpha particles. Uh, just after the action of alpha particles, we cannot see any of these uh, defects, but uh, to make them visible, uh, we etch the uh, so we let's say put some specific uh, reagents, some acids or some uh, diluents to dissolve the destroyed uh, part of the plastic. And uh, when this destroyed part, destroyed by the alpha particle part of the plastic is removed, then we see this uh, alpha um, tracks. And we can count them, and we can also see uh, there uh, our source of the alpha particle is located. Alpha particles is located. So we can use uh, this technique not only to count the number of alpha particles, but uh, the main purpose is to find the source where it is located in our sample. For example, if we have soil or I don't know some. Uh, rock materials, uh, and we would like to see uh, where is uh, our radiant lights are concentrated. Uh, then we can use uh, this technique. Uh, the new generation, let's say, of track analysis is a uh, different phosphor screen uh, uh, techniques. These phosphor sc screen techniques uh, they are inorganic materials. So. On the left side, it is plastic, so organic material, solid organic material. But here, it is inorganic materials. It is um, uh, mixed uh, barium fluoride bromide with the uh, addition of um, small amounts of europium, but in the oxidation state plus two. And this uh, europium 
can accumulate uh, the uh, energy uh, produced by alpha or beta particles. And then uh, this absorbed energy uh, can be emitted after irradiation by laser. So it is induced uh, irradiation of light induced by the uh, laser. And uh, again, we can see the location of the radionuclides. Uh, and some few words, additional uh, words uh, for gamma spectrometry. Uh, you're already familiar, I, I believe, uh, with the uh, gamma spectrometry. And um, uh, what, what is a very good uh, case when we measure our radionuclide, when uh, all the energy of gamma quanta is absorbed uh, in the, the detector material. And in this case, we see this peak that is uh, related to the uh, full energy of our gamma quanta. So we just measure uh, the energy of gamma quanta. Uh, we can uh, say what is the radionuclide by the energy of gamma quanta, and it is good. And uh, in this case, uh, in the middle, it is so-called um, uh, photo peak. That means that uh, all energy of gamma quanta is absorbed uh, by the electron, and this electron uh, generate current that we measure. Another case can be when we have multiple scattering of the initial gamma quanta, but all this uh, scattering is happening inside the ma detector material. And finally, even if there is several uh, sc uh, scatterings, all the energy of our initial gamma quant uh, will be absorbed again in the uh, material of the detector. And in this case, we also will observe uh, the photo peak. Uh, that means the uh, peak with the full energy of our gamma quant. But if during this scattering, uh, our scattered gamma quanta is uh, released from the detector, we will see some continuous spectrum, so some uh, probability of the release of this uh, gamma quantum with different energy. And that is uh, that we call uh, the Compton effect, Compton scattering. And uh, this um, uh, continuous uh, part of the spectrum is called uh, Compton uh, continuum. Uh, so it is not very useful for uh, analysis. Uh, there is also some other risks, uh, risks when we uh, have uh, gamma quanta with the energy higher than uh, 1,022 uh, 1, kilo electron volts. In this case, uh, uh, the electron positron pair can be produced <clears throat> and part of the energy uh, can be lost uh, due to the uh, release of the annihilation uh, gamma quanta from the uh, material of the detector. And thus, uh, we will observe peak with either, uh, with either one uh, escaping energy, so one escaping annihilation uh, gamma quanta with the certain energy of uh, 511 kilo electron volts. And so this is our full energy, yeah, with this high peak. And if we have a single escape, we will have a peak with the energy uh, with lower energy, lower with uh, 511 kilo electron volts. Or if two annihilation peak uh, gamma quanta uh, released, then we will observe another peak with the energy lower uh, to our main peak lower to uh, 1022 uh, kilo electron volts. So even one radionuclide can produce uh, several peaks. And there is an example of uh, strontium sample irradiated with datrons. Uh, there is for production of yttrium-88. And uh, the energy of, the, of gamma quanta released by the yttrium-88 is um, 1836. And uh, you can uh, observe this uh, one peak with the single escape and the second peak with the uh, double escape. So just uh, as an example. Another problem can be if we have a, a cascade 
of gamma quanta and um, the time between the release of two uh, gamma quanta is very short and these uh, two gamma quanta uh, can be uh, summarized as one uh, gamma as one gamma quanta. So in this uh, spectrum, you can see two uh, separated peaks that are related to two gamma quanta. And you can see this third peak that is uh, uh, really just the sum of the two um, separated peaks. And it can be a problem again. Okay, if you have only one radiant light, it can be quite easy to understand uh, that it is just a, a cascade, a cascade uh, summarizing. But uh, if you have a very complex mixture of radionuclide, it will be very difficult to see all these uh, all these uh, relationships. But you should know that uh, it can happen. Uh, efficiency of detectors uh, depends on the geometry on the shapes on the materials the higher the energy <laughs> the better uh, so and uh, again the energy resolution if you have a complex mixture of radionuclide is very important if you have only one radionuclide like cesium 137 or cobalt 6 or whatever it doesn't uh, very important to have um, uh, different uh, very high energy resolution but if you have a uh, mixture of radium clouds you uh, certainly have to have good detector with high uh, resolution but today there are different scintillators um, under development for to use as uh, uh, detectors because scintillators in principle they are much cheaper than uh, germanium high purity so um, new detectors <laughs> let's say are coming uh, there is a problem can be when we measure uh, some sources with high content of beta emitters because one of the mechanisms of interaction of beta particles with uh, matter is the production of so-called Bremsstrahlung or stopping uh, radiation so it is x-ray radiation uh, produced when uh, beta particles interact with matter um, uh, so Um, you can see on this spectrum um, that we have uh, effect of this uh, X-ray uh, Bremsstrahlung uh, when we measure the source with high uh, content of beta emitter. So it's also um, it should be taken into account. But there is a simple technique to exclude this. Uh, it is the use of aluminum uh, screens to stop uh, the beta particles uh, to, um, let's say, absorb uh, soft X-ray. And then uh, we can see uh, the spectrum of the uh, gamma uh, radiation. So there is a comparison uh, between uh, initial spectrum without uh, screens and with uh, aluminum screens. So, and uh, after this <laughs> short, uh introduction uh yeah we have uh, uh let's say uh, we had a concert, uh, conversation with natalia kuzminkova uh, she will start a bit uh, later so i have uh, this uh, destructive characterization of radioactive waste uh, part and um, why it is important because um, uh, when we have um, uh, radionuclides that are not gamma uh, emitting radionuclides, uh, then we cannot measure them without any uh, pretreatment. We should prepare the uh, counting source uh, that contains our radionuclide. And to do this, we have to make uh, some stages, uh, either pre concentration or dissolution uh, stages, and then we should separate our radionuclide to uh, make uh, the measurement by for example liquid scintillation uh, possible uh, so there is um, a sample destruction uh, methods different uh, you can see here it, it is acid leaching ashen um, uv assisted oxidations and uh, that are very efficient 
ways. It is microwave digestions and uh, fusion. So we will see uh, some examples. So fusion is the melting of our samples with uh, further uh, dissolution. Uh, so quite uh, convenient and effective methods. And another, uh, here is the examples of different fluxes uh, that you can use uh, to melt and to dissolve further uh, your sample. So if you have either silicates or you have some metal oxides or uh, other materials, you can uh, choose uh, your flux uh, depending on your uh, material to make the destruction of your sample uh, efficient. Another uh, way to uh, destruct the sample for further separation is um, um, the microwave digestion. So we use also some acids in aftercloths and use microwave because uh, with using microwave, we can reach the higher reaction rates and uh, the whole uh, dissolution or destruction of material is much uh, faster. Again, um, uh, when we are talking about uh, the use of acids, uh, we can uh, use different uh, combination of acids. It can be either single acids like um, hydrofluoric acid, or it can be mixture of, for example, nitric acid and hydrofluoric uh, acid, again, depending on uh, your sample. Uh, very often, uh, we have to use uh, traces because uh, uh, we have to calculate the chemical yield uh, of our procedure. Uh, as any uh, chemical reaction, there is no 100% of our uh, chemical yield. Uh, so, uh, and there is no, let's say, when you make chemical procedures, uh, there is no mm, tabulated uh, values of uh, how efficient uh, your procedure. Every time, uh, every uh, time you have to analyze well, what part of your sample was dissolved, what part of the retinoclide that you analyzed is uh, uh, now in the measuring source or counting source, and to do this to uh, trace uh, the efficiency of a chemical procedure is uh, the use of the tracer. So it can be either uh, either isotopic. Uh, tracer or uh, non-isotopic uh, tracer, then you use uh, chemical analog of your element. If it is uh, not possible to use uh, stable, for example, isotope of your radionuclide. And um, there is just an example of uh, diff different tracers for actinides. And on this alpha spectra, you can see the red um, red peaks, uh, they are uh, related to the uh, traces that are added to the sample. So uh, when you add tracer, you know exactly how much you add. So the how, uh, uh, what the activity of your tracer and uh, by calculating uh, the amount of tracer in your spectrum and by comparison uh, with the known activity, you can calculate easily the efficiency of your chemical procedure and then recalculate uh, the activity of your measured uh, radionuclide with using this uh, information. Uh, so for separate radionuclides, uh, we can use different methods. Uh, yesterday it was a special lecture by Peter Matveev uh, about different techniques. I would only uh, stress your attention here that uh, when we use, uh, when we separate radionuclides or any other elements, there is always a heterogeneous system. So either it is a uh, uh, border between liquid and solid, when we are talking about the precipitation and chromatography, or it is a liquid-liquid uh, to immiscible liquids, uh, when we're talking about the ex liquid extraction, or it can be gas solid uh, border uh, when it is gas adsorption uh, or sublimation. And um, we use uh, these techniques to separate radionuclide because um, we can have, for example, difficult to measure uh, radionuclide in our um, sample, uh, like pure uh, beta emitters. 
with low energy of uh, beta particles like carbon-14, for example, or nickel-63, that we cannot measure uh, with any other techniques except uh, of um, uh, liquid scintillation counting, for example. Uh, but to make it possible to measure them, we have to separate them in individual form. Uh, just a, a, again, uh, uh, reminding that uh, when uh, we have a precipitation, we have to reach uh, the solubility product constant, but very often the radiant nuclides are in uh, very low concentration and we cannot reach this uh, solubility product constant. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, we can use uh, carriers uh, that help us co precipitate our target uh, radiant nuclide. Uh, uh, precipitation method is uh, very simple and can be used either to remove. Uh, some interfering uh, radionuclides or to separate our target radionuclide from the matrix, or we can use uh, it to for pre-concentration of the radionuclide. For example, if we have, I don't know, 100 liter of uh, water sample, then we can precipitate uh, our radionuclide and we can concentrate it. Um, there is a list uh, of some examples of carriers for the uh, radionuclide of interest that you can use uh, in your work. Again, uh, for alpha spectrometry, we use uh, this precipitation method for uh, production of the counting source. Um, so the, uh, uh, the positive uh, moments of the precipitation is that it's quite simple. Uh, we can concentrate our uh, sample and it is easier to scale up this uh, method from milligrams to tons, I don't know. Uh, but there are drawbacks uh, because precipitation is time consuming, it's not very technological <laughs> and uh, it uh, can uh, use large amounts of our uh, uh, carrier. So another method is solvent extraction. Again, I will not go in detail in mechanisms of liquid extraction as it was yesterday, uh, but just to remind you that uh, we use two immiscible liquid, organic and water solution, and uh, our radium chloride uh, is redistributed uh, between uh, these two liquids. And um, when we ex uh, extract our radium chloride, it goes to the organic phase and it's called extract. In uh, aqueous phase, it's called refinate. And when we uh, strip our uh, radium chloride back to the uh, aqueous solution, we call it back extract. Uh, so uh, just for some terminology. So the good uh, part of the solvent extraction is uh, it is uh, very fast and uh, very selective. We can uh, synthesize or we can uh, choose uh, the specific uh, ligand, specific extractant for our uh, radium chloride and it will be uh, very selective and uh, liquid liquid extraction is used uh, in many technological applications so uh, it is also quite easy for scaling up um, that is also good uh, property of extraction that even for uh, very low uh, amounts of uh, radionuclide of, of very low uh, radionuclide concentration this method um, uh, works the drawbacks is uh, the use of flammable solvents and the uh, production of uh, large volumes of uh, organic waste. And also uh, the efficiency, not selectivity, but the efficiency cannot, uh, can be not very high. So sometimes we have to use uh, several steps of the uh, extraction. Um, chromatography. Uh, again, it is a method for separation when we have a redistribution of our uh, target uh, retinoclide between the liquid phase or gaseous phase and the uh, stationary uh, solid phase or immobilized liquid phase on the inner uh, support. Um, the uh, Ion exchange, that is the uh, main me mechanism in uh, chromatography, is uh, reversible and uh, very fast. And uh, we can say that uh, there is two main types of uh, ion exchange. Ion exchange resins, it's 
Cation, either cation exchange or anion exchange. And uh, the good uh, property of the chromatography that we can say that it is uh, multiple repetition of the single uh, redistribution of radiant light. So we, uh, let's say, we repeat uh, many times uh, the single separation step and thus finally uh, we have uh, very good uh, separation efficiency. Uh, so uh, the main uh, cation exchangers uh, contains either uh, sulfonate or carboxylate uh, groups, uh, so they are quite different in uh, their uh, strength. Uh, and uh, an ion exchanges uh, very often contains just this quaternary mine uh, groups with different composition. The uh, qualitative description of chromatography, as in liquid-liquid extraction, is the distribution coefficient and also the uh, separation factors. So it is the ratio of two uh, distribution coefficients. Uh, what is uh, um, benefits of ion exchange. Again, it's quite simple uh, and efficient method uh, as far as uh, it's a multiple repetition of uh, single uh, redistribution. Uh, it can it is uh, used in many uh, applications, not only in laboratory but uh, in industry as well. So we have quite a lot of experience uh, in using ion exchangers and. Um, it is possible uh, to separate our target radiant glide for, from interfering uh, ions. The drawbacks of the ion exchanges uh, that uh, the capacity is not um, uh, very high. We again produce uh, secondary waste, quite problematic because ion exchanges is uh, organic materials and it's uh, difficult to uh, treat them. And uh, the uh, ion exchanges uh, are not so uh, selective as uh, liquid uh, extractants or uh, or uh, extraction chromatography, and we will uh, see now what is extraction chromatography. So extraction chromatography combines uh, the select uh, the efficiency of chromatography, so it's a dynamic process. And we combine uh, this with the selectivity of the uh, extractants, of some certain extractants. And thus, we have very efficient method with very high selectivity. So it is uh, very fast and uh, selective uh, methods. To produce uh, the extraction uh, resins, extraction chromatography resins, we can use some inert uh, support. Uh, porous support uh, with spherical forms, spherical shape. And uh, we put the organic phase, we saturate uh, these porous materials with the organic phase. Uh, and organic phase, it is dissolved uh, extractant. And then we remove uh, the diluent, and thus uh, the extractant is located in the, por in the pores of our uh, inner support. And uh, uh, here is the example of how this extraction chromatography resins can look like. You can put them in a vacuum box to uh, make the process even faster. And uh, you can use uh, one resin to separate one radium, radium glide, for example, even from very complex mixture. There is, a, again, a list of different existing uh, resins, uh, commercial resins, that you can use uh, to uh, separate your uh, radiant light, the radiant light of your uh, interest. There are some examples like actinite resin um, um, that is uh, used uh, for separation of actinite, uh, as you can see from the name of uh, all this resin. Uh, we can use it for pre-concentration of actinites even from large volumes uh, of uh, aqueous samples and then we can dilute them and measure either by alpha spectrometry or LSC or whatever. Teva uh, resin is used uh, for tetravalent actinides uh, separation. So uh, the main component is the aliphatic quaternary amine 
uh, that um, interacts with the anion uh, uh, complexes of the tetravalent actinides. And then uh, you can uh, easily elude uh, these uh, complexes by using uh, more, uh, just more um, less concentrated uh, acid. Utava resin is used for uh, separation of tetravalent and hexavalent uh, actinides, uh, mainly for uranium. <laughs> so this is the name of Utava uh, resin, and it, it can be used for separation of uranium uh, from thorium. Uh, strontium resin, again, from the name of the resin, it's quite obvious that it's used for separation of strontium. And uh, here it's um, um, crown ether uh, that is uh, dissolved in uh, octanol. And uh, crown ethers, uh, they're quite selective for uh, S elements, for uh, alkali and alkali earth uh, metals, cations. Uh, you can choose the size of your crown ethers uh, to extract your specific uh, cation. And uh, you can see that strontium can be separated even uh, from uh, barium and radium, so and even calcium. So it's uh, quite uh, efficient uh, separation. So uh, the benefits of the uh, extraction chromatography is very high selectivity. Uh, it is uh, so selective that you can use uh, the specific resin to separate single uh, radionuclide uh, from the mixture of uh, different radionuclides. Uh, it is quite modern uh, uh, methods. Of course, there are also some drawbacks. First of all, it's quite expensive. <laughs> it's uh, more expensive than other ion exchangers, uh, ion exchange resins, or uh, just uh, extractants that we can use for liquid, liquid extraction. And also, uh, you cannot use these resins uh, many, many times. So it can be used two, three times, and then the efficiency um, is decreasing. Uh, so, uh, as a short summary for this uh, uh, destructive uh, methods, that uh, we need to separate radionuclides uh, when we uh, need to uh, analyze uh, difficult to measure nuclides like pure beta emitters or pure alpha emitters. Uh, we cannot measure them uh, by gamma spectrometry, for example. Yeah, uh, we should have uh, to uh, separate them and use. Uh, liquid uh, counting technique or uh, alpha spectrometry. Uh, there are different methods and uh, you can uh, combine them uh, to make the separation um, selective and uh, efficient. We have to use traces uh, to calculate the chemical yield of our chemical procedure. Uh, in some cases, we can uh, we should use uh, carriers when the uh, concentration of radionuclide is very low. Uh, extraction chromatography, I would say uh, today is uh, uh, most selective uh, method for separation of individual uh, radionuclide and very fast method. Um, so uh, the precipitation and uh, solvent extraction can be used as a pre-separation step uh, to either to remove the bulk matrix uh, uh, material or uh, to pre-concentrate uh, our target radiant light. And you can use, uh, for example, vacuum boxes uh, to uh, make the separation even faster. So thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I would be glad to ask them. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Thanks for your uh, presentation. Uh, I ask about uh, yes. detectors. Yes. Uh, types of detectors so so we have uh, many types uh, of detectors uh, this one can uh, say for gamma ray beta and alpha uh, mm -hmm. 
The famous one, I think, hybrid germanium and jelly, uh, this one in germanium lithium and uh, scintillation yes. and another one for uh, gamma. So this one, every time when I go to lab, I also I use my friend and uh, the researcher use uh, this one. So we can uh, find uh, better than uh, this uh, detectors, for example, in efficiency and resolution, you can get uh, better efficiency and better resolution. So, yeah, well, my, my some con... problem. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if we are talking about efficiency, uh, then the uh, germanium detectors are, are not very efficient. Uh, the more efficient are uh, scintillating uh, scintillators. They have higher efficiency, but lower resolution. <laughs> uh, but again, uh, depends on your task. If you uh, measure, for example, um, content of the cesium-137, for example, uh, in your samples, and there is uh, almost no other radionuclides on the cesium-137, then you don't need high resolution. Okay? You just uh, you can use just a scintillator detectors uh, detector and with high efficiency. So you will short your time uh, to for measurement, uh, um, and you don't need a high resolution. Um, so another case, if you have uh, if you don't know <laughs> what, which radian class you have, then you need high resolution, maybe. Uh, the efficiency will be lower, but you need high resolution. Then, uh, in this case, you you uh, you will use the high pure, high pure germanium detectors. There is no uh, better choice uh, for high resolution detectors. Uh, the combination uh, of these two parameters is very difficult. <laughs> uh, so there is all, all, always a balance, but uh, for high pure germanium detectors, uh, they have uh, detectors with quite high efficiency, but they are big. And uh, due to this, due to this, uh, they are quite expensive. <laughs> so again, some balance uh, of cost, efficiency, and uh, energy resolution. Uh, so, uh, but your question was uh, about this uh, topic I, or uh, yes but uh, i yeah. ask if there is we can find uh, efficiency and resolution in a new new one not higher but germanium actually you have any information about new detectors and new techniques or something about that uh mm some brand new uh, techniques uh, I, I don't know but uh, there are quite a lot of different types of the gamma uh, detectors yes uh, with high efficiency but again um, they they are very expensive <laughs> no for us so, <laughs> at least okay. so okay, uh, yes. you can find uh, really a detector high uh, pure germanium detectors with high efficiency high resolution but at very high cost <laughs> yes i know that. so uh, if we have uh, time i ask about uh, track detectors and uh, tld detector yes yes uh, mm -hmm. this one just i want to know because this one very near from my uh, mm -hmm. research and my work uh, about track detectors we have uh, uh, cr39 and lr and uh, bm we know that mm -hmm. these types. So uh, I think this one uh, for alpha particles. So we can use track mm -hmm. detector for uh, gamma ray or, for example, X-ray, or can't we just so use this for one? X-ray, uh, there are other um, specific uh, detectors, yes, uh, like uh, 
the conventional uh, detectors for X-ray diagnostics. Yeah? So you, you can use them. Uh, for uh, gamma rays, uh, you can use them as well, but of course with uh, lower efficiency. Okay. So uh, TLD. Uh... So it's not the track. Uh, it's not, they are not track uh, detectors because uh, you don't need to uh, uh, leach this uh, material. Uh, they are just like uh, films, uh, like um, photo films. So thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. Not more. Okay. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you. Hope to see you next week. Ah, yes. And tomorrow I will have another lecture. Yeah, see you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Natalia, please. We have a limited time. Okay. Okay, we have 20 minutes to jump. Uh, because I understand that the schedule is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we have a limited time, uh, just as I said before, just jump for the important points of uh, non destructive methods uh, of characterization. Uh, radioactive wastes. Where is my presentation? Leave this picture. <laughs> I like. <laughs> yeah. But as you understand, I think, and uh, well known that uh, the best and uh, the first uh, non-destructive method is gamma measurements, yes. Uh, using gamma measurements, you can uh, take uh, unique and uh, a lot of information about radioactive waste. And it, and it is, doesn't matter is the waste inside the container or not. And um, I will just show you some important points. And uh, of course, uh, usually scintillator detectors are using uh, for first assessment of uh, radioactive uh, containers or radioactive persons or any radioactive materials uh, because of very high efficiency, yes, but with a bad resolution. Uh, what problems and uh, uh, points we want to discuss? I want to discuss is gamma radiation detection mechanism, uh, uniform distribution of activity in the container. For example, if you have such problem, absorption of gamma radiation in the walls, self-absorption, and matrix material and self-absorption calibration uh, we discussed yesterday, and uh, library as well, and. Um, in the end, period, I will show you um, some points about uh, digital radiography. Uh, you know that more than 2,700 uh, radium clides are um, now known. And uh, I'm sorry for Russian, but uh, in the vertical, uh, you can see uh, the numbers of radium uh, And uh, in the <clears throat> X line, it is uh, time, uh, the half lives of radionuclides. And uh, you can see that uh, more than 600 
20 radionuclides has half lines from one minute to one hour. And uh, the period uh, from 10 to 100 years, it is only 20 radionuclides in the planet. Uh, of course, uh, that uh, radionuclides uh, that uh, has uh, a lifetime uh, less than one day, a day uh, using uh, in uh, radiopharmaceutical investigations. Uh, gamma radiation detections. Uh, the important points in discrete structure of the spectrum and um, which makes it possible to identify the radionuclide composition. High penetration power of gamma radiation. Uh, and uh, the decay of most radionuclides is accompanied by instrumentally measurements emission of radiation. And uh, period. Uh, for example, you have a problem. Uh, you have uneven distribution of activity in the matrix. You have, for example, hot particles in container. Uh, and uh, you should understand uh, are hot particles exist or not. And uh, nowadays it is only one uh, simple method, approach. Uh, you just need to rotate your container uh, during measurements. And you will see exactly uh, when uh, the gamma spectrum uh, peaks increase, uh, you'll see that uh, you can imagine that uh, container uh, ex in container exist hot particles. And uh, of course, uh, you can just uh, go uh, around the container with the gamma spectrometer, but uh, it is very important. The important thing that you have to do when you investigate uh, containers. Next. Uh, absorption of gamma radiation in the walls of container. Of course, uh, you should remember about it always. And uh, uh, you need to, to note it uh, in your calculations. Uh, the absorption efficiency takes into account uh, the influence of intermediate material such as detector housing, uh, measuring uh, capacitor, and etc., uh, that uh, absorb some of the incoming uh, radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the uh, equation, the sample efficiency uh, in the fraction of emitted gamma rays that actually leave the, the sample material. Uh, well, and here is the example. You see, for example, spectrum of radium-226 and radium-226 with a lead container. Uh, you can see uh, how much the peaks decreased because of uh, 3 centimeters uh, lead container. But, of course, uh, using... Uh, uh, good equipment, you can identify that uh, exactly that it is radium. And uh, some of peaks are um, disappeared. Some of peaks uh, just decrease. Mm -hmm. It's volume uh, 166. Uh, you can see uh, that peaks uh, with low energy disappeared because of uh, the shielding, because of lead, uh, three just three centimeters uh, thickness. Mm -hmm. One more, but, uh, and uh, not only absorption in the walls, but uh, radionuclides has also self-absorption. And uh, self-absorption depends on the countable sample material, the volume and shape of the counting sample position and orientation of the counting sample uh, relative to the detecting unit. That's why be careful, uh, yes, with your um, radioactive uh, containers. Better to analyze it uh, uh, in from different, uh, fr from different sides. This is a linear uh, attention coefficient of gamma radiation. I think uh, uh, most of you can find these equations uh, if it's needable, but you have to understand uh, that um, 
everything impossible to calculate. And if you note uh, the self-absorption, the absorption in the wall, the um, uh, thickness of shielding, uh, you can uh, calculate and identify all radionuclides uh, just using gamma spectrometry. Mm -hmm. Uh, infinity in the thickness of a layer of matter equal to seven lengths of free path of gamma quanta of a given energy. Um, it is, I think, very simple to understand. Okay, next. And uh, for heavy materials, uh, for example, infinity thickness uh, may be less than one mill millimeter. Therefore, uh, when making a counting sample, choosing geometry the, to determine radionuclides in it, it is necessary to take into account its composition and density in order to correctly choose a thickness that uh, should not approach infinity. For example, here you can see the picture of self-absorption of uh, Mauritian 241 line. If we take uh, different geometry with uh, different volume of uh, waste consisting uh, americium 241. And uh, another method uh, is uh, is a um, digital radiography method. Uh, of course, uh, you cannot uh, identify exactly what radionuclides exist in your material, uh, but you can uh, see the map of radionuclide distribution through uh, your um, sample. Next. And uh, for example, you can see outer radiography of uh, the uh, leaves and steel and uh, the resolution of this method is very, very high. And uh, uh, this method uh, has a, a lot of advantages. And uh, for first of all, it uh, can uh, indicate alpha, beta, and gamma radiation and uh, uh, induced radiography under the action of external uh, excitation. And uh, radiography with known radionuclides uh, are using uh, for modeling experiment. For example, here in uh, radiochemistry division, we are using uh, outer radiography uh, when we investigate uh, uh, radionuclides migration pathway, for example, from the soil or from the grass or as well as fish and other, other things. And uh, hands, for example, uh, this is very, very useful method. And uh, please, next. Uh, detection system in radiography is based on the use of material that are sensitive to ionizing radiation. Uh, this uh, digital radiography is a modern me method, but uh, all of you know uh, the old uh, method, uh, just uh, photo. Uh, for the emulsion method that uh, used the uh, Henri Bicquerel, Marie Curie, and others. But nowadays, um, this process uh, of radio uh, outer radiography is digital, very simple, and uh, um, not very expensive. And uh, um, really, uh, when you're working with uh, exactly radioactive waste, it is very uh, faster method to find uh, hot particles in the waste because uh, you can um, slice uh, some uh, soil, for example, on that uh, uh, plastin, and uh, you will see hot particle very, very fast, and you can identify it correctly. Okay, it's just two steps that you need to go through uh, our radiography process. It's exposure. Uh, imaging plates are placed in close contact with the sample under investigation. 
uh, europium-2 is ionized to europium-3, and the radiation energy is stored in um, brom vacancies. And uh, after that, you read out unstable europium-3 returns to the ground state europium-2 emitted uh, photons, which are collected by a photo uh, multiplier tube. tube. Uh, <clears throat> as you see, uh, no equipment uh, can work without uh, electronic photo multipliers. But in uh, for radiation, uh, it's only one uh, good quality method to identify uh, and correct count uh, radiation. Okay. And uh, this is the last slide. Uh, I think uh, enough. Uh, using uh, digital outer radiography, you also can color your sample uh, and uh, make uh, different pictures. You can make 3D, um, 3D pictures, uh, 2D pictures. Uh, you just can uh, make uh, maps. For example, here you see just uh, leave and uh, uneven distribution of uh, Cesium in the surface of uh, this leaf. And uh, of course, if you, for example, take a look to this leaf in the optical microscopy, you will see nothing. And uh, But digital radiography gives you a opportunity to identify where uh, cesium accumulates. And after that, you can uh, try to understand why. And for example, if you use uh, scanning electronic microscopy after outer radiography, you can uh, find that uh, radionuclides, sometimes it is very difficult task to understand is the radionuclide went uh, through the structure of the tissue or it just stick on the surface. And uh, of course, uh, for example, imaging plate uh, cannot uh, solve this problem. But if you use uh, different methods together, uh, you can see. And uh, as for me, as my experience, uh, most of radionuclides just sticking on the surface of uh, the uh, biota uh, or soil. And uh, to, to and really it can, cannot be uh, washed in simple by water, but the mechanism is just uh, seeking. Okay, thank you very much. You have a coffee break. Mm.
Dear colleagues, please take your seats. We are continue. So our new lecture about uh, very interesting uh, project uh, from Russian Federation. Ilya, please, floor is yours. Thank you, Andre. So dear colleagues, good afternoon. My name is Ilya. I represent the International Research Center on Multipurpose Fast Neutron Research Reactor, MBIR, or as we call it here in Russia, MBIR. So before we get started, let me just uh, tell you a few words about the International Research Centers, who we are, what do we do, what are the other functions. So we are an international organization, an international consortium that uh, consists of B reactors investors who, after making financial contribution to the project uh, realization, uh, become participants of the international consortium. We at the consortium uh, invite new participants to the International Research Center, provide them with all needed administrative, legal, and reporting assistance. Uh, we also conduct reactor rights allocation and coordination of the joint scientific research programs. We also ensure that all the participants' needs in reactor resource and in research uh, at MB reactor are fulfilled. So uh, today's lecture is about the beer project in general, and more particularly about the beer reactor, uh, its construction characteristics and experimental capabilities, including isotope production. I will also tell you a bit more about the International Research Center. So uh, we'll talk about its specifics, participants, and upcoming events. Yeah. Next slide, please. So to start with, let me give you a short overview on BIR reactor in general. So BIR is a generation four research facility with a multipurpose fast neutron reactor and sodium coolant. It is a loop type reactor with free cooling circuits. Uh, the facility is designed as the most high flux uh, fast neutron research reactor in the world with 5.3 uh, by 10 to 15 degrees maximum flux density in the core. MBIR is also a very uh, versatile and multipurpose uh, research facility, um, which will be equipped with a wide range of experimental devices, including seven horizontal and six vertical uh, experimental channels, providing for a variety of uh, research options. So the reactor is being constructed by the Rosatom State Atomic Energy Corporation in the city of Dimitrovgrad, which is located in the Samara region, and will be operated by Research Institute of Atomic Reactors, NIAR. The reactor is currently under construction and its power startup is planned for 2028. Here in the slide, uh, you can see the key milestones on the construction stage. So the construction started in 2015. And as you can see here in the slide, at the beginning of this year, the reactor vessel was installed in the design position. It was January this year. By the end of 2025, the assembling of the turbine units and reactor facilities is planned as well. Well, by 2027, it is already planned to achieve the first criticality of the reactor core. Next slide, please. Uh, just a few more words about the construction stage. Uh, so as I have already mentioned, the construction began in 2015 and the reactor has been under construction for eight years so far. Albeit the construction goes quite smoothly. Uh, so the construction plan has already been exceeded by 30%. So we're actually going ahead of the plan right now. Uh, as for the current stage of affairs uh, and the construction site, the pressure vessel has already been installed and the next uh, key milestone to achieve till the end of the following year is the installation of the reactor building dome. The current estimated data of the completion of the uh, installation of, of the reactor dome is September 21st, 2023. Next. The idea of the construction of the multipurpose research facility with the fast neutron research reactor is aimed at uh, creation of the scientific platform that will provide all its participants with an access to generation four technology and will be able to meet topical challenges in the field of innovative nuclear technologies. 
Moreover, Mbir uh, research facility is supposed to provide the complete cycle of high-tech services from pre-radiation in pile to post-radiation research materials and elements. It's also worth to note that functioning of the Mbir reactor and the International Research Center goes in line uh, with the unsustainable development goals. In more details, uh, it is supposed that the International uh, Research Center and the Mbir reactor itself uh, will become a worldwide center of competence for fast neutron technologies, which will allow uh, consulting participants not only to conduct complex research on up-to-date topics, uh, but also to launch joint international uh, scientific research programs with organizations and research institutes from all over the world. This will allow to establish the synergy of international schools of uh, science and technologies. After the construction, the reactor will allow to conduct a variety of research uh, and fundamental and applied studies to study technologies of uh, the generation for nuclear reactors, new technologies of nuclear waste management and closed uh, nuclear fuel cycle operation, as well as to validate the safety uh, of the operation of nuclear reactors. It's also important to know that one of the goals of the International Research Center is to provide all the consortium members uh, with the remote access to the experimental data bank, so they have an opportunity to get an act to get an access to uh, the results of the and joint research anytime from any part of the world. The last but not the least is uh, conducting educate educational programs related mostly to generation four. Uh, reactors technologies. Uh, we believe that the Mbir's destiny is not uh, only to be a research instrument uh, of the future, but also to become a platform for sharing knowledge and experience and educating future generations of engineers, scientists, and managers. Next slide, please. Here in the slide, you can see the reactor layout. Uh, as you can see, it consists of the vessel itself with the reactor core and the autonomous loop layouts. The main research facilities where the most of the research related uh, to, for example, isotope production, uh, materials testing, fuel testing, and technologies of the closure of the nuclear fuel cycle will be carried out. As I have already mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, the reactor has research facilities outside the reactor core. Uh, there are two kinds of experimental channels, seven horizontal and six vertical ones. They, be, they will be used for specific kinds of research, uh, such as, for example, nuclear medicine, nuclear medicine, including neutron capture therapy or fundamental studies. As for the characteristics of the beer reactor, beer is a sodium and water fast neutron reactor with loop type reactor configuration. Having three autonomous loop layouts and three heat circuits allow uh, the reactor to conduct various research in different spectrum. The reactor uses MOX fuel, an alloy of uranium and plutonium, uh, and it can produce up to 150 megawatts of thermal power and up to 55 megawatts of electric power. But what is the most important is the flux density, uh, which makes Bio reactor is the most high flux uh, research reactor in the world. So, as I have already mentioned, beer is estimated to produce up to 5.3 uh, by 10 to 15 degrees neutrons to centimeters as a maximum, and uh, 3.1 by 10 to 15 degrees neutrons to centimeters as an average neutron flux density. The designed lifetime of the reactor is estimated for 50 years. So it is expected to operate until 2027. Next slide, please. Yeah. The B reactor will provide an access to a wide range of research fields. Its capabilities uh, give an access to conduction of scientific uh, experiments in such fields as closure of the nuclear, nuclear fuel cycle technologies, like minor octanite burning and fuel reprocessing, other research fields that the bio reactor will be capable to uh, are material science research, for example, testing of the dispersion hardened materials, ferritic, matonistic, and austenitic steels, and etc. Uh, another uh, capability of the bio is testing 
a few of different ceramic uh, compositions, including metal or gas fuel. Beer research facility also allow uh, some isotope production, a sufficient internal working volume of the reactor, both in the core and in the loop layouts, makes it possible to implement some programs for the production of several kinds of isotopes. Take into account the features of the reactor, fast spectrum and flux density, uh, and etc. the reactor can produce the following uh, main isotopes. First of all, it is cobalt, cobalt-60 more particularly, which is a better active isotope with a half-life of uh, 5.27 years and which is used in radio surgery mostly, for example, for the production of gamma knives or for sterilization of medical instruments and for other technical purposes. Another isotope is uh, gadolinium-153 with a half-life of 240 days, which can be used in magnetic resonance imaging, for example. Stortium is another one uh, which decays with a half-life of 56.9 days and used for diagnostic purposes and for reveal, relieving pain for the patients with uh, bone metastasis. Another one is iodine-125, which decays with a half-life of 59.5 days and can be used for the treatment of oncological diseases mostly. The last but not the least is xenon-127, uh, which decays with a half-life of 36.4 days with the emission of gamma quanta, and which is used um, mostly for single photon emission computer tomography. In addition, it will be possible to produce uh, short-lived isotopes in beer as well, uh, mostly in the thermal spectrum using a zirconium uh, hydride moderator in the place, in the reactor place, uh, where re refueling is possible without shutting down the reactor itself, for example, in a loop channel. Uh, those possible isotopes are molybdenum-99, uh, is one of the most widely used artificial radioisotopes, radioisotopes in medicine today, uh, and which is mostly used in radioisotope diagnostics. Another one is iodine, but this time it's iodine-131, uh, with a half-life of eight days and uh, which emits beta particles, which is used for diagnostic purposes and for the treatment of thyroid diseases. Finally, talking about MBIR experimental capabilities, it is important to point out uh, a wide range of non-energetic and fundamental studies, such as nuclear medicine, uh, education, radiation technologies, nuclear facilities, and basic studies, including ultra-cold neutrons. We believe that this variety of research uh, options and capabilities will uh, give an opportunity to make science more technologically advanced and facilitate uh, common efforts on the way to clean and comfortable future of our planet Earth. Uh, that was about the characteristics. Next slide, please. Um, and its research facilities. Let me just tell you a few more words about the International Research Center and our achievements uh, by now. As I have already mentioned, in January this year, the research vessel was installed in design position. And it was possible due to the fact that more than 1,400 personnel involved in the construction. And uh, it's planned to install the reactor dome by the end of the year. Another important thing to point out is uh, that in 2023, Beer International Research Center joined the Briggs Grain uh, research infrastructure platform. So MBIR reactor became one of the Briggs research and mega science facilities. We hope that this fact will mark a new opportunities and horizons for cooperation with BRICS uh, member states, and currently we are actively working on establishing some cooperation with uh, these countries. I have already told you about the International Research Center. Next slide, please. Uh, just in a few words, it was just in a few words. In details, um, it carries out all the work related to the investors' participation in the consortium and in the research at the Mbir reactor. Uh, consortium, or the International Research Center, as it's called, uh, is the world center of competence for fast reactors under the auspices of international organizations. First of all, the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency or Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, for example. It is also an international scientific platform uh, in the field of 
innovative nuclear uh, technologies, which provided extensive collaboration involving, uh, involving international experts from uh, organizations and um, research institutes from all over the world. This allows the participants of the consortium to contribute to the technological and scientific development of uh, their own states. And IRC, International Research Center, possesses a unique experimental base for implementing those various tasks, which provides uh, consortium members with a full range of high-tech scientific services they need. We invite international partners, we as a consortium invite international partners to participate in the research and offers several uh, favorable conditions for joining at various stages of the project implementation. For example, joining uh, during the construction stage, which is going on right now, or after the power setup and commissioning, which we call the operational stage. We also offer uh, different forms and kinds of partnership with us, for example, uh, joining consortium as a principal member or as an associate member. We also have an option for those organizations who would like to join the consortium only for working uh, on the experimental channels without even touching the reactor core. So we have a special option for them joining as the experimental channel participant. Let me also, next slide please, provide you with more details on how Mbir uh, International Research Center is structured. So uh, International Research Center Council is the main administrative body that consists of the representative of the uh, consortium principal members. Uh, and it is responsible mostly for strategic, strategic management, budget and research approval. It has several additional bodies and organizations that take care of the rest of the work. Uh, first of all, there is a consortium leader, the organization that I represent, uh, which is responsible for consortium management, financing, and administrating. There, are, there is management committee uh, responsible for budgeting and planning control of the compliance with the consortium rules. Uh, it is also responsible for audit and other control activities. And for sure, there is a research uh, institute of atomic reactors near uh, the main and the sole operator of the bio reactor. It is actually the key organization in terms of maintain, maintaining the research and bio reactor and at which side the reactor itself is construction right now. Uh, a few words about the another administrative body that they haven't touched yet. It is the advisory board. Next slide, please. Actually, it is a scientific consultative, a consultative uh, body aimed at consolidation and prioritization of the participant scientific proposals and the applications, coordination of the multilateral programs and joint research program preparation. Uh, the advisory board is chaired by distinguished Dr. Uh, Kalmakov Stepan Nikolaevich, vice president of the Russian Academy of Science and uh, a scientific director of this very faculty uh, of chemistry at MS MSU. Uh, despite the fact that the reactor is still under the construction, uh, the advisory board is already actively functioning and has already uh, become a platform for international scientific cooperation within or beyond the consortium itself. Uh, thus, on July 12th at RIAR in the city of Dimitrovgrad, uh, there was the first meeting of the advisory board that took place. 56 experts from 13 different uh, foreign organizations and research institutes took part in the following event. Uh, yeah, that was the first meeting. Uh, I would like to point out that participation in the advisory board is absolutely free for any organization from any country, regardless of the uh, participation status in the consortium itself. So the advisory board conduct meetings in, on different scientific topics and have several uh, internal committees on all of them. Next slide, please. So they are the committee for a safe use of nuclear technologies, which is responsible for conduction of discussion on justification of availability and operability of uh, research reactors. Another committee is the committee for code validation. There's also committees for materials and fuel research, nuclear fuel cycle closing committee, and non-power applications of nuclear technologies committee. The last one is actually uh, the most active one right now. So uh, it's already been conducted two 
uh, meetings of this of, the, of this committee. The first took place on December 16 last year uh, in Tomsk, Russia, in TPU, the Tomsk Polytechnic University. And the second one uh, was conducted this year in Tashkent, the Republic of Uzbekistan. So the next one is scheduled for this year too, approximately in the autumn of 2023, and is supposed to take place in Dugna in Joint Institute for Nuclear, nuclear Research. So uh, the advisory boards conduct meetings uh, on all of these committees uh, a few times a year. So we are planning to make the work of all of the committees more active, not only for the last one. You can also see that uh, for the following year, there are two meetings of two other committees are scheduled as well. There is a meeting which is supposed to take place in September. It's going to be a meeting of the Committee of Materials and Field Research. And another one uh, that's supposed to take place in St. Petersburg in October, it's the Nuclear Fuel Cycle Closing Committee. Uh, it is scheduled for October 9, 10. Next slide, please. So that was about the advisory board. A bit more about the International uh, Research Center and how, how it does work. So when joining the International Research Center, the potential member uh, first of all, should choose uh, can choose between two formats of joining, as I already mentioned, uh, as a principal or associated member. Joining as a principal member means uh, joining the research center during the construction stage and allowed to get some benefits, uh, for example, the technical ones, like a priority to choose and prioritize the structure of the reactor load and access to beer for the whole. Uh, designed lifetime of the reactor and guaranteed access to both uh, experimental channels and the reactor core. Next slide, please. There are some other benefits of joining the uh, International Research Center during the construction stage. Some scientific benefits like uh, an opportunity to participate in joint uh, scientific research with Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, the Kurchatov Institute, as well as with the leading research institute and uh, research organizations from all over the world. It's also an opportunity to be a member in all governing bodies of the consortium and uh, participate in the decision-taking process. Another one is participation in the development and implementation of the multilateral research programs. And there are also a few financial benefits of joining the consortium during the construction stage. First of all, joining the construction, uh, joining the consortium right now means lower price for uh, joining and for purchasing the reactor resource, uh, which is two times lower than for the associate members. So the ones that will join the consortium during the operational stage. It's also an opportunity for a deferred uh, payment, an option of purchasing additional research rights at a discount price for the price for the principal members, and an option of accumulation of reactor resource rights uh, if the following organization uh, has such need. Yeah, next slide, please. Talking about international cooperation in general, we work with uh, the organizations and research institutes from all over the globe. There are more than 20 states and organizations that are in the list of partners of the International Research Center. Uh, the three of them are at the advanced stage at the moment. They are the People's Republic of China, the Republic of Uzbekistan, and uh, Joint Institute for Nuclear Research with other potential partners such as India, Algeria, United Arab Emirates, Brazil, Egypt, Belarus, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, Korea, Saudi Arabia, Serbia, Morocco, Armenia, Bolivia, Argentina, uh, South Africa, and the member states of the African Commission of Nuclear Energy. We're actively working on establishing cooperation uh, on the partnership and on the participation in the consortium on bioreactor. Next slide. Finally, let me also briefly tell you about the upcoming international events and activities related to MBIR project. So in August this year, we are planning to make a report at INPRO Small Module Reactor Forum in St. Petersburg. The next meeting of the advisory boards uh, committees are planned for September. There's supposed to be two meetings of two different uh, advisory board committees, as I have already mentioned. Uh, both of them will be in September. 
Uh, and in September as well, we are conducting the roundtable discussion uh, in frames of the general conference in Vienna. The complete list of uh, the upcoming international activities and events you can see here on the slide. So I just wanted to add that we would be happy to uh, meet up with you at any of those conferences if you're planning to participate. And we'll have a discussion with you on beer project or uh, nuclear technologies in general. Yep. So thank you very much for your attention. Hope I managed to introduce uh, the beer reactor and the International Research Center to you. I would be happy to answer your questions if you have ones. Uh, I may not be able to provide you with some technical specifications on the reactor, since some of the info is not supposed uh, to be publicly discussed, uh, and I'm not an engineer myself, but I will do uh, my best to answer your questions, or at least uh, to give you my business card and pass your question to our engineers. Thank you very much. So any questions? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Okay. Um, when you were making mention, you mentioned about, um, I didn't see a slide on safety because uh, you said uh, he uses sodium and water. Um, the safety aspects like uh, uh, the Monju fast reactor, which is a liquid uh, meta fast breeder. Yeah, that's not uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I get I get this. So I'm asking about uh, the compartment. You know, uh, the reaction between uh, sodium and water is very uh, catastrophic. So what uh, safety is uh, is implemented for this, and also for the MOX fuel, you said uh, plutonium and uranium. What about for countries which uh, they don't have uh, MOX fuel? Or how do you, how do this work? The mox well, yeah, that's all. in service, so all of them can be used uh, different plants. Uh, could you please um, give us information about what kind of uh, spent nuclear fuel are you planning uh, to reprocess? Are you planning to reprocess? Yeah. So, uh, right now, uh, since the reactor is still under construction, yeah. Um, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So yes, uh, we are planning uh, planning uh, fuel reprocessing. As right now, since the reactor is uh, under construction, uh, there are only plans for that. So uh, I can give you more detailed information uh, after uh, communicating with our engineers, since this is the, still the information that supposed to be discussed with them. Yeah. So, but uh, if you're interested with them, I can give you my business card, and we can pass this question to them. Probably they already have some answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, you just mentioned that there is a, a 
principal member fee and the associated member fee. Can you elaborate if you have any specific uh, amount? What is the fee? Yeah, thank you for your question too. Yeah, there are two, two formats of participation, associate member and as a principal member. Uh, there is some specific uh, amount of uh, money that you should pay for purchasing the exact amount of reactor resource. For the principal members, it is much lower, two times lower. I unfortunately cannot tell you the exact um, amounts since it's commercial secret. Yeah, but if you're interested personally in buying some reactor resource, sure, we can elaborate on them. We can prepare a contract for today, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Leah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, next presentation, are you there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Zero. Hello again. Uh, so it's uh, one uh, another presentation from me today, and I was asked uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, our international activities, projects, uh, and uh, a bit more about integrator of uh, Resatum for decommissioning and radioactive waste management. So we can go ahead. Um, I think. I, I will practically skip this slide because um, you are quite uh, aware of the um, uh, major <laughs> features of uh, Rosatom. Uh, but uh, just in a couple of words, it's a huge uh, organization comprising many enterprises in different uh, areas, in different uh, uh, parts of the nuclear fuel cycle and uh, uh, integrated supplier of uh, reactor technologies, nuclear fuel and backend solutions. We can go ahead. Just to uh, understand based on these figures is that uh, Resatum pays really serious attention to such matters as uh, uh, research and development, uh, development of the human resources, uh, development of uh, new technologies and solutions for more efficient, for safer um, um, ways to treat the matter of nuclear, whatever it would be. Uh, so, um, I represent company Twell. Twell is uh, one of the largest uh, uh, suppliers of nuclear fuel of different types, uh, primarily and traditionally it is a fuel of uh, hexagonal uh, shape uh, in its cross section for reactors of um, Soviet and Russian types. And uh, also it um, uh, designs and uh, manufactures and supplies the fuel for research reactors and uh, uh, is also active in many other areas. Also uh, that includes its scientific basis, R&D base and um, uh, related uh, um, fields of uh, research. Um, since 2019, uh, Twell is also um, assigned the role of uh, being an integrating company for whole Rosatom uh, for the topic of decommissioning and radioactive waste management. Uh, 
And um, that is based on the um, knowledge, understanding that um, in uh, fuel companies, well, that is more than just uh, joint stock companies, also many enterprises in Russia. We have uh, 10 production sites uh, and uh, different uh, sites, uh, types of uh, facilities um, of uh, scientific type, R&D type, etc. cetera. Uh, and um, uh, throughout the track records of our enterprises, uh, we were facing the situations when uh, some uh, facilities were reaching its uh, end of life cycle, and uh, therefore the competences, uh, competences and references were gained to decommission these uh, facilities, uh, some exact buildings or uh, big pieces of um, equipment, uh, remediation of sites. Uh, so uh, that's a wide profile that uh, uh, helped to choose well as uh, the integrating company for this area of business. We can go ahead. So uh, currently we have uh, uh, four centers of competence, how we call it. So these are four uh, companies within our structure that uh, have its own uh, unique, uh, sometimes experience of uh, decommissioning, of uh, uh, managing radioactive waste. And uh, uh, based on that, uh, we um, decided to uh, use this knowledge gained and uh, this experts' uh, expertise uh, to bring that further into the market, not only Russia, but abroad. And um, uh, currently, within uh, uh, our uh, structure of Rosatom, 58 uh, companies are participating, included in this infrastructure. So they are not, uh, it's wider than just a fuel company 12, but there are other enterprises and companies that uh, are uh, in our infrastructure, let's say, and uh, when deciding on uh, some solution, for example, for the markets uh, here or abroad, we are considering where do we have the best competences, best solutions among the uh, companies uh, to do that work, to, to uh, elaborate into that. Uh, besides um, uh, having the uh, business, side of that yes and that's uh, more than 100 per, uh, 100 uh, projects realized in russia and abroad because we also have uh, new chem technologies uh, engineering services that is uh, in our assets and uh, they have uh, their good track re records of uh, projects realized uh, in design and uh, epc contracts and many things uh, so uh, we also uh, develop uh, the um, educational programs and uh, that includes two master programs one of uh, uh, this program is uh, realized on the basis of Moscow State University that uh, hosts us for this uh, summer school. Another one is a uh, National uh, Research Nuclear University, MEFI, also in Moscow. Also, we have certain um, cooperation agreements with uh, other uh, institutes such as Tomsk Polytechnical Institute, University, sorry. Uh, but um, uh, on a wider scale, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Rosatom at Hall and uh, we in our uh, area of business and decommissioning and radio waste management, we put efforts and uh, budget and uh, uh, good uh, experts and expertise available into also into solutions of uh, new uh, development, de development of new solutions for the markets for this area. Uh, so that is uh, one of the um, um, parts of uh, kind of in integral um, uh, business approach that we use and um, uh, we look for the um, uh, kind of uh, gaps in the, in the uh, technologies, in the solutions, uh, somewhere where uh, we feel that uh, we could do it better, but uh, where solution wasn't found. So uh, here we uh, invest into uh, R&D projects and um, from time to time, you can see it in the news. Like for example, uh, this year we were uh, reporting on first results on the uh, ozone, using ozone for decontamination, um, or for example, for um, uh, working now also on uh, decontamination of the working clothes without use of uh, water. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of uh, dry cleaning. <laughs> So other other things like um, technologies and cutting being developed uh, and uh, some others. Um, well, 
all of that, not only, um, so uh, we talk about um, uh, various uh, things like uh, doing business, like uh, uh, getting to the track of uh, uh, safer uh, technologies, safer ways to treat uh, radioactive waste and decommission. And um, all of that also contributes to uh, achievement of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We can go ahead. So, uh, well, I hope that, uh, and I, I believe that uh, for all of us, it's uh, not just words, yes, because uh, uh, on one side, it's a fashionable thing that uh, uh, is easy to use. But uh, on another hand, if we consider it's really uh, touching very serious things. So uh, solutions that we offer for the markets, uh, first, they are uh, working for the benefits of uh, improving of operations of the facilities, uh, and um, that also deals with the development of uh, new uh, solutions, uh, improving technological capabilities uh, that is uh, beneficial for the whole market. And um, on another hand, uh, that is social responsibility in this area, as well as uh, in other areas uh, where TWIL works, uh, because uh, traditionally, uh, as a kind of legacy, let's say, it's not only a nuclear legacy, but uh, uh, as far as uh, Russia was active for many decades in nuclear, uh, it's uh, thousands, many, many thousands of uh, people, uh, very well educated, prepared professionally, uh, and we need to continue bring this knowledge, sharing it, uh, recording it, keeping that and uh, developing it. So it's uh, many things to consider with regard to social responsibility and also in the area of uh, backend. And the uh, third part that you can see here in another color on this light uh, green is about environment and ecology and definitely uh, the way we treat uh, red waste, for example, and the way we uh, manage uh, the safety aspects of decommissioning projects, it all influences um, uh, how efficiently will we uh, release the uh, environment uh, from our footprint after the uh, decommissioning of uh, nuclear facilities. We can go ahead. So uh, further to the areas of uh, uh, some exact uh, uh, works, uh, services, uh, solutions for the market, uh, majorly uh, uh, we can divide it into three parts. So first of them uh, is engineering services. So uh, as far as we have a certain um, quite broad capabilities in design, in um, uh, performing different calculations, substantiation, uh, work uh, in the area of uh, aiding um, legislation uh, um, basis for, for the for Russia and for other countries. Uh, that uh, is uh, quite, uh, well, except uh, one of the uh, business units, let's say, uh, business directions that uh, uh, is uh, uh, available for um, Russian companies, Russian clients, and also for the ones abroad. Uh, as far as many countries or some countries are now new to, to the nuclear energy and embarking these uh, programs, uh, this um, we just feel and uh, we see as kind of response from the market that it's um, uh, quite demanded to uh, be able to uh, help uh, newcomer countries to um, fill these gaps or even create from the zero, help them to create this uh, infrastructure and uh, legislatory uh, concepts, uh, methodologies, and all that relates to um, such phases that are not yet happening but should be considered right from the start. Uh, as for the actual works of decommissioning uh, and dismantling, disassembly of equipment and structures and components. Uh, this uh, includes expertise in um, uh, realization of different projects in Russia and abroad. Here again, uh, we have uh, vast uh, track records of uh, new chem technologies. Uh, mostly uh, these are projects uh, realized in Europe, but also in, uh, uh, by the way, even in, in Russia and in Asia. In Asia. Uh, I will show it in the later slides, I think. And uh, this uh, deals with the basic um, uh, stages and basic works related to decommissioning, such as, uh, uh, well, 
if you go through the stages first, it's removal of the nuclear products and uh, spent nuclear fuel from the site, which enables already to decrease dramatically the um, uh, potential hazards in the facility. Yes, then it's uh, decontamination in various stages of the works, the dismantling of the equipment, systems and components, and um, uh, after all of that work, rehabilitation and uh, remediation of, of the territory. Uh, to proceed with a release from regu regulatory control. And the uh, red waste management, um, it uh, goes along the, way, the whole way. Actually, it uh, even starts uh, much earlier in the operational phase or even in the planning phase. Yes, when we want to, uh, currently in the contemporary approach, we want to uh, calculate, to plan in advance what would be the um, um, necessary pieces of equipment, uh, waste flows, how to deal with that, how to minimize it from the start. So it's uh, all parts of this uh, decommissioning by design and uh, waste management by design to consider it uh, in a sound and uh, uh, lean way. And uh, in the stage of decommissioning, definitely uh, uh, that uh, is uh, one of the important aspects uh, throughout the process of decommissioning. And uh, um, Finally, uh, these are solutions for uh, red waste storage after the, uh, let's say, volume reduction, packaging, repackaging, uh, characterization, other things. So finally, it's uh, first storage and then final disposal in the repositories. Uh, here in the picture, yes, by the way, you have seen today in the morning. Uh, this facility, this is Framus, which I showed about uh, um, this uh, um, assembly uh, line for for uh, characterization and sorting of uh, uh, bulk materials. We can go ahead. So a bit ab about our integrated offer and uh, the uh, products and services. Uh, we tried more or less also to put it on the uh, say timeline, although some of the uh, works also happen in uh, other stages of the life cycle of the facility. But basically that's uh, just in a brief that uh, includes uh, a work from uh, design and development of uh, decommissioning concepts, uh, strategy, adding into the plan for, de for de uh, future decommissioning. Uh, preparing and the connection of uh, complex engineering and radiological survey uh, or mapping, uh, the um, uh, development of the decommissioning project itself and uh, preparation of the pack of licensing documentation. I don't know how is it in your countries, but in Russia, it's a really big pack. And uh, uh, without that, you cannot obtain the license for decommissioning, start the works. So uh, the... Uh, set about actual works, uh, dismantling and fragmentation. So this includes uh, various uh, technologies and solutions for dismantling, for cutting, for uh, fragmentation uh, from the major large components such as uh, RPV, uh, um, uh, re reactor internals and uh, other systems further on uh, in the nuclear island and beyond and dismantling of uh, equipment, uh, demolition of the building and uh, uh, coming to the stage of repurposing of the facility because sometimes it can also be uh, decided that uh, the uh, facility would be further used but uh, with another purpose. Uh, the infrastructure, actually, it's in the part uh, that is somewhere on the preparation for decommissioning. Uh, that uh, includes different sets of equipment, such as for treatment of uh, different flows of waste, such as uh, solid red waste, liquid red waste, uh, solutions for uh, decontamination of uh, system structures and components, and uh, uh, etc. As for red waste, uh, red waste management that uh, deals with uh, different pieces of equipment, uh, solutions, uh, facilities, uh, such as for removal of uh, solid red waste, for sorting uh, along the uh, way of treatment of the uh, red waste, uh, conditioning, um, that is a, a obligatory phase, and um, uh, transportation for the storage and final disposal. As for uh, decontamination, also we have the uh, wide uh, uh, set of uh, solutions. Perhaps you have seen that in the first day in the uh, virtual presentation that I was making on the um, uh, Resetum's uh, decommissioning business. So um, as one of the fresh cases, uh, recent cases to mention is the one that is created in Angarsk in our one of the uh, workshops that was created to uh, to pass uh, the uh, 
abstract um, elements of uh, different uh, type, different sizes into the series of uh, decontaminating uh, phases. And uh, well, when, when it reaches the necessary state, it can uh, be free released or uh, sent for storage or um, compacted if it's not clean enough, let's say. And uh, as for um, the uh, last stage of uh, decommissioning project, rehabilitation of uh, territories and decommissioning um, uh, that uh, normally relates to um, uh, characterization and uh, in our case also sorting of uh, uh, bulk materials such as soil. And um, after land is clean, uh, we can release the site from the regulatory control. We can go ahead. Um, I don't know if it's too small or you can read it, but uh, here uh, we have put uh, also in this kind of uh, life cycle of decommissioning uh, some references of um, uh, integrator of Rosatom, let's say in broad term, uh, in decommissioning and radio waste management in uh, different countries. Uh, so, so this includes uh, uh, such references uh, as in decommissioning itself, in uh, uh, preparation of uh, design documentation uh, for um, calculations, uh, substantiation, uh, also um, the physical works such as dismantling and uh, decontamination, fragmentation, packing and uh, sending for the storage. Also, that's um, uh, in the top level part, you can see uh, the bunch of uh, works uh, for um, design and uh, construction of uh, spent nuclear fuel storages, uh, which is also in uh, our frame of business. Uh, and some other things like Mm, I don't know, that's quite uh, a few to mention, but uh, I will briefly touch upon some of them in the, in the further slides. We can go ahead. Next one, there, here. Well, uh, here it's uh, like uh, looking from another point of view, so it's not from the references, but uh, from availability of the uh, expertise. So if, again, if we go along the way from transition to uh, shutdown uh, through um, carrying out uh, comprehensive engineering and uh, radiation survey, dismantling, decontamination, um, steam generator, reactor internals, uh, etc., through the way of uh, uh, red waste management, site remediation and storage and disposal. Uh, so here you can see the uh, companies, uh, mostly from um, uh, Russian sites, uh, that uh, have the necessary competences, competences, sorry, competences and uh, solutions for uh, performing works and uh, carrying out uh, uh, relevant projects. And uh, here you can also see the uh, available technologies and solutions, such as, for example, if we talk about... Uh, um, let's say for red waste management, that's um, um, characterization, sorting, incineration, what was um, talked about uh, today, uh, like incineration, pyrolysis, plasma, uh, evaporation, fragmentation, compaction, uh, uh, remelting, vitrification, etc. Yeah, and um, well, some of our competences are also outside of Russia, like um, uh, in, uh, let's say, in dismantling of reactor internals uh, by Nukem or dismantling of reactor pressure vessel. Um, but uh, that's also within our, within our structure. Let's go ahead. Uh, but let's go ahead. I have some pictures and uh, uh, brief part follow examples. Next one. There is still some something hidden. Yeah, in the references. So it's just a little bit about uh, the um, reference projects, uh, mostly broad. Let's say like big works, substantial works uh, that are uh, carried out by um, uh, within our structure by Nukem, uh, such as Philipsburg and um, uh, RPV cutting uh, at Oskarhamn and uh, Barsebeck in Sweden. This project uh, uh, is now in the phase of uh, finalization, and um, this uh, this is a big milestone because it's uh, uh, it's brought a lot of new competences to us and uh, knowledge 
of uh, potential um, uh, features let's say uh, how to deal with that how to deal with scheduling because uh, especially in the first projects uh, uh, you find out that sometimes there are some surprises that happen along the way and you should consider it for the uh, further projects and uh, for example as for uh, Swedish projects uh, uh, this deals with uh, four um, units of reactors and uh, the uh, if you can um, uh, compare the speed for the first project and the further ones, uh, it was significant, uh, significantly lower uh, term necessary for treatment of uh, this task. So we were starting with one year and uh, the latest ones are around six months for realization. Uh, we can go ahead. Yeah, here are some uh, examples also of uh, red waste management. And uh, these are quite, uh, Broad uh, here in the center, for example, you see the waste treatment center uh, for Aku UNPP in Turkey, and uh, that is uh, done uh, by Nukeman Cooperation with uh, Nikim Tatum Stroy. So it was uh, uh, within this package of um, um, the equipment for Aku nuclear power plants, uh, solutions such as um, incineration, super press, and something else. Um, and uh, Khmelinsky and PP, this is, uh, it included uh, incineration facility and uh, concentration and, uh, well, uh, um, other uh, systems to treat different types of waste. Uh, we can go ahead. Yes, this uh, I also touched upon uh, shortly that we have uh, certain uh, competences and projects realized, uh, realized in the area of uh, uh, spent fuel storage facilities, and uh, this can include uh, both Russian and uh, German um, expertise in design and uh, in uh, um, well uh, creation and uh, realization of the projects for such uh, storages. And some of the examples are, for example, in Ignalina in um, uh, Lithuania, uh, in Kozolodui, uh, Bulgaria, and uh, uh, the one in uh, Dukovane. Czechia, right? Czech Republic. Let's go ahead. And some uh, uh, some other references uh, that are beyond, let's say, physical things. Yeah, that's uh, uh, work with the uh, documentation, work with the uh, calculations, analysis, and some uh, quite uh, specific, uh, unusual, but uh, help to realize very big projects such as ITER, for example. Or um, this can include feasibility study, uh, different evaluation of um, uh, economic scenarios, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there is one thing more that I wanted to touch upon in the next slide. Yes, these are some examples this is, uh, in Angarsk. Uh, well, it's a Russian uh, uh, reference, but uh, say it was good to also to mention it here. Uh, with Framus, which we uh, have seen today. So this is one of more recent pictures of it uh, for characterization and sorting of bulk waste of uh, uh, part of remediation project. And another one that is uh, now uh, been in some final phases is uh, a re rehabilitation of industrial sites Taboshar in Tajikistan. And uh, that deals with the uh, uh, remediation of the uh, former uranium tail site. And uh, uh, here we already reached really uh, significant results and uh, the works uh, are plans to be finished before the end of this year. So uh, in the site uh, where the works have already been carried out, the um, uh, radiation background uh, phone already reached uh, the normal conditions, uh, which is about uh, 0.2 microsieverts. And um, um, there are still several stages to uh, finalize, but uh, we expect that it would be finished by the end of this year. These works are physically being carried out by our design uh, institute. This is CDTI, Central Design and Technology Institute, uh, part of Russia, uh, part of uh, 12 field company. Well, I think now it's all about uh, this uh, uh, matters. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Uh, so if you have any questions, I will try to answer, or perhaps if I can't answer, then tomorrow I also expect that uh, Sergei Semen would be here, my uh, closest colleague uh, from uh, uh, in the Commission Integrator, who will also be talking to you on some other topics, but can also share some views. Thank you.
Thanks. Uh, well, I think we can easily skip to some uh, more pleasant parts, but uh, whatever, I'm here with you today. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Centers of competence. So, for example, one of them is uh, Angarsk where you've been, yes, I think, in uh, Angarsk elect electrolysis plant. So that's a, a facility that uh, traditionally was used for enrichments of uranium. And some of the um, um, workshops, it's, uh, say it's a one kilometer long uh, facility uh, containing rows and rows and rows of uh, centrif uh, not centrifuges, it's a gas diffusion, gas diffusion machines. So uh, these, uh, uh, this equipment was uh, decommissioned, uh, dismantled, uh, it, uh, it's um, uh, further decontaminated and uh, uh, put in, I think it will also be compacted. So what I have seen with my eyes, yes, is that uh, they have built uh, the specially uh, designed uh, workshop where they have the set of uh, different um, uh, equipment for decontamination and for other treatments. And um, uh, this created first uh, uh, first bunch of, uh, let's say, this uh, um, expertise. And uh, as far as uh, the utility, this um, uh, enterprise was dealing with that with it itself, it gained these references. So it became one of our centers of competence. So one of them is uh, this Angarsk plant. And they have some special department for decommissioning. And uh, by collecting this uh, knowledge and expertise, they can, uh, that's a part of, uh, let's say, the concept that uh, um, these centers of competence uh, create this knowledge basis that can be used further uh, to share it, to implement it in projects, um, and further use for both for, uh, let's say, scientific business and other matters and um, uh, keeping the knowledge. Uh, other um, enterprises that are included into the structure as um, Sibirsky chemical plant, uh, uh, Siberian chemical plant, yes, it is in, uh, 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 sorry, in Seversk, in Seversk. So they also have a um, uh, good background in decommissioning. Uh, for example, by the way, decommissioning um, one of the uh, industrial reactors and uh, uh, radiochemical plants and uh, two um, open type facilities uh, for storage. So they were like uh, using uh, the barrier materials covered. And now it's, I was there, now it's uh, green fields practically. So the second one is Siberian chemical plants. Third one is uh, CDTI, who was doing this uh, works on rehabilitation of Tabashar. So it's a central design and technology institute located in Moscow. And uh, the fourth one, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, OEHK, Uralski electrochemical plants. So actually, uh, there are also other facilities like, um, um, or it might be, by the way, VNNM, uh, Bochvar Institute, because they have, uh, first they have uh, references in decommissioning of uh, their uh, different laboratories and buildings that uh, works with the uh, um, radiochemistry. And uh, second, they also have good experts in uh, creation of, by the way, decontamination uh, solutions, such as, uh, I think, uh, perhaps they were discussed yesterday in one of the presentations of Gleb Barashev when they were asking about these films and the foam and other things. Yeah, so it's uh, part of technologies uh, developed by, well, available um, by um, Bochvar Institute. And also uh, this uh, um, hydra, um, hydra separation for the, for the soils, one of the solutions. Welcome. So, oh, we can talk in any uh, more informal matter on any things as well. Thanks so much. Thank you.